Welcome everyone to AA Housing and Urbanism presentations of MARC student thesis work. Uh, and it's a, a day of celebration. And uh, my, my co-director, George Fiore, and I welcome all of you. Uh, it's always a big moment for us when we get to this point in the year when we can look back at what uh, the students have accomplished. So I want to start by telling all of you a little bit about the ethos of the program and the kind of work that we do. We are a program that looks at urbanism as a project that has the power to initiate or nurture urban transformation. And we like to look at this as something where our students are aware of the drivers of change that they're harnessing to enable those kinds of transformations where urban areas can find new value in associational practice. We prefer not to begin with a predetermined polemic. Instead, we like to look at architecture as a way of opening up conversations that enable experimentation and a, a new kind of associational life. And I think you'll see that coming across in the students' work. Now, they're very diverse projects this year. Uh, we've had our largest cohort of MARC students ever, and the diversity, we use that, those numbers to enable us to expand the range of themes that we're looking at. And so in both sessions, morning and afternoon, we'll see five students in each session, and they've been arranged in a way to highlight the diversity of interest that we have as a program. At the same time, you can see that all of them are multi-scalar, and all of them involve these aspects of thinking about territory or urban area, looking closely at a project and thinking about what is changing in today's particular conditions. Another point about the work is that we tend not to emphasize the peculiarities of site so much as the repeatability of urban conditions. So we ask students to think about identifying an urban condition, and of course, they will know something about the site in doing that. But the emphasis will be more on understanding the way in which what they learn is transferable to other kinds of situations. And so the, the work that we're looking at is something that we feel helps us uh, find the conversation between broader urban visions and an awareness of the detail uh, of architecture that will enable delivery of projects to take place in urban areas to be uh, effectively transformed. Now, today, uh, we have in our jury um, a wonderful combination of old friends and, uh, and new participants in the life of our program. So Katerina Borsi uh, from the University of Nottingham, a former uh, external examiner of projective cities and uh, one of our uh, long-term uh, sort of friends of the program ever since her days as a PhD student here in, in, uh, uh, at the AA. Uh, and Katerina has gone on to lead a number of design programs at University of Nottingham and in a way has built up uh, a kind of uh, conversation with uh, the AA through the, this sort of sense of shared uh, interests in uh, typomorphological research. Um, she's also written books on the crossovers between domesticity and urbanism and is in that way very much tied into the kind of thought that we carry into our program. Lee Bennett, who is a partner at Shepard Robson, is a former external examiner of housing and urbanism, so he knows the program perhaps as intimately as anyone on earth, uh, and we're delighted to have him back to look at this year's uh, edition of this. We also have with us today Mary Duggan, uh, and Mary is, uh, is uh, coming to us for the first time, and we're delighted to bring Mary's uh, interest in quality and atmosphere and material that she shows in 
the projects of her office, uh, for which she is the, the founder and, uh, and director of Mary Duggan Architects. And Mary's work is known for the understanding of detail, and that's something that we want to build further in our program. So we're delighted to have you here. And we also have with us, for the first time, Simon Henley, uh, one of the founding partners of Henley Hale Brown. Uh, has won many awards for their really forward-looking approach to uh, architectural reasoning in the context of very demanding uh, London sites especially. And uh, Simon, we're really uh, delighted that you could make it, especially since on the way in, Simon's, um, uh, Simon's train had to uh, be canceled because there was a landslide that took out the entire rail line that he was due to travel on. So uh, for your heroic efforts to find a new way into the school, we're, we're absolutely hugely appreciative. Um, now, uh, the, the morning session will be chaired by my colleague Dominic Papa. The afternoon, we will have additional jurors, and uh, Anna Shapiro will uh, chair that session. As I say, we'll have uh, five, um, uh, five presentations this morning, beginning with Eduardo Carcavilla. Now, Dominic, I'll let you take over as soon as Eduardo's done, and that way we'll just skip right to Eduardo. But Eduardo's, uh, Eduardo is leading off because in many ways his work uh, cuts across many of the themes that we see in the program, an interest in major uh, urban armatures that you'll see sort of showing up repeatedly, the idea that rail lines, uh, water systems are important to the way in which we think about things at scale, but also understanding the way in which uh, an approach to morphology can help us address those, uh, the, the, all the variations through which the, those extended arm Amateurs run. Uh, so, Eduardo, we're, we're delighted to begin with you, and please come take the floor. So, um, good morning. My name is Eduardo, and I am presenting Manufacturing New Learning Grounds. Since the moment we are born, uh, we learn from others, from our parents, from our families, from our teachers. But we not only learn from people, we can also learn from nature and landscape, which provide discovery and exploration. Cities have also learned from this relationship by intensifying former industrial employment lands and connecting them uh, with greenscapes uh, and also uh, waterfronts. Nevertheless, these places were already um, inhabited before by communities that encourage a skill development and maker's culture. Carpenters, pottery sculptors, gardeners, they all conform a community. They all make an identity. So what if we use this identity and capacity to generate in intensification in industrial enclaves that could become a new learning landscape? where industrial elements such as distribution yards and sheds are used as platforms for knowledge and housing frameworks. We can look, for example, uh, the very well-known Lee Valley at the north, uh, west, uh, northeast part of the Thames as a tributary that starts uh, behaving as an armature for different industrial enclaves around the river and the green areas. But I would like to show you in more detail what happens in this uh, less known tributary called the Wandle that goes through four different uh, boroughs starting from Croydon to Wandsworth. <clears throat> So if we look closer, uh, and I ask you to rotate the north, your north to the left side of the screen, uh, we can see how uh, these industrial enclaves that are in uh, beige color start uh, having a strong relationship with the parks, but at the same time cause huge fragmentation. 
However, maybe we can start thinking about uh, their size as uh, connectors and creating future networks with the re existing residential spaces, but also with the educational institutions that are also part of this larger system. Maybe it can become a regional intervention that not only accommodates infrastructural devices by its linearity, its beauty can be an armature for more, bringing service, making an educational uh, stakeholders and create a large knowledge corridor. If we look with more detail, one segment of uh, an industrial enclave that would be here, um, we can see two things mainly. First, that uh, the size of the warehouses starts determining the dimension of the plots between the high street and the armature of the river and the park. Um, but also, we can see that uh, some yards that have different programmatic uh, yeah, goals, objectives, uh, can start to create some kind of framework. <clears throat> a, pro uh, a proposed striated framework that takes advantage of linearity, the linearity of the river to generate continuity, recognizes uh, the size of the sheds uh, and also the yards and how can they start uh, assembling. Um, while the distance between the park and the high street uh, is wider, the framework offers a permeable ground that uses uh, intermediate space between what is new uh, or what can be proposed, the existing buildings and the landscape. Uh, but in the other way, when the system starts getting very narrow, very compressed, uh, all this in intensity is condensed um, and maybe we can start thinking about more hybrid structures. So we, if we look at this like striated system in a larger uh, scale, maybe we can start uh, to think um, of the type of porosities that it can produce not only in the north-south uh, axis, but also from the west to the east. <clears throat> the system is a morphological tool where, where housing form changes, housing form changes, uh, depending um, <clears throat> from the width of the um, composed between uh, the high street and the river, and that has a potential of consolidate, consolidating patterns of continuity uh, between yards and the wor existing warehouses. Um, also, we can watch how building adjacencies uh, and how they are grouped around uh, different type of yards starts creating uh, relationships not only between them, but also to the other side of the river where we could replicate this system. Uh, so we have like a multi-directional system of uh, new continuities. So in different widths, different opportunities appear for the existing buildings. And yards uh, take a more important urban role where observation of productive and creative activities can take place, learning can take place. An analogous operation was used for Barking and Dagenham strategy uh, to identify uh, expensive employment lands where morphological studies of horizontal adjacencies and their variation uh, could start compressing um, the volumes to a level that they start uh, stacking one over each other in order to generate value even in very small sites. Uh, this can produce uh, keeping industrial land instead of exposing it and expanding it instead of replacing it. So, 
when we look at industrial rivers, maybe we can practice uh, observation as the artist did way long before we did. Um, trying to look beauty, but also opportunities of uh, domesticity or uh, leisure environments and connection to uh, uh, different type of morphologies. So if we look at uh, the conditions existent in the area, we can use them also to drive ch uh, our design. So for example, when the yard continuity is interrupted uh, by a shed, um, this shed can also become a connector between the high street and the park. But also, it can become a community work, working place and start making connections with these deeper uh, building housing volumes. Where the park takes their, uh, diversion and starts spreading uh, inside the grid of the city, uh, yards starts, uh, start to become central in catalyzing uh, different types of activities. An interweaved system that allows variation and integration by dissolving the boundaries between the park, the housing, the yards, but also between the high street and the new developments that a logistic area could uh, be produced. <clears throat> Um, so in the same way, we can also observe how linear buildings can create porosity opportunities, but also start connecting some minor volumes uh, and work as uh, another armature. Of the same way as the housing can start to become some kind of filter between river, park, and also these new uh, learning yards. And where there is the minimum width between these contour lines, um, the impermeability maybe can be rethought, um, generating a porous skyline of morphologic uh, variation. So if we think in these yards, uh, as assembly units, we can start playing with them uh, and maybe consider it like a frame in very simple way, like in, in their sizes, uh, from the widest to the more narrow one, um, <clears throat> and understanding their conditions and possibilities. Yes, in the widest one, uh, housing volumes can acquire deeper proportions and thereby deeper ground manufacturing space, consistent with its morphology. Then internal distribution starts to play with shared space and courtyard space for manufacturing and collective work. The case of Soul House uh, can illustrate uh, this idea where uh, urban coherence uh, can be shown while its typology also enhances uh, this cooperation. Uh, but also, um, if this is a changing plan, uh, flexible, it can also start making a dialogue with the manufacturing grounds uh, that, and pieces that can be produced uh, in this other volume. <coughs> when the system starts to constrain, uh, the housing uh, morphology also starts to get narrow, um, <clears throat> and the housing becomes more linear. But in order to keep uh, these sharing spaces, um, we can use the building that uh, Lundgaard and Tranberg um, designed before the famous Tidgen dormitory. And they already experimented with the idea of grouping living rooms and kitchens outside the flats in order to reduce the dormitory area and create good quality uh, shared space. <clears throat> This condition is grouped in towers that create new adjacency to green spaces, but also start connecting between each other through transparency. This is Titgen Dormitory, if you didn't know it. Um, <clears throat> 
So this can be a mediation where more isolated characteristics are found in a model analogous to the artist's room. Serialization can be grouped, and what could be shared, in, uh, what could be a shared living room as the other exemplar, maybe we can think of it as a shared working space area for uh, the people that live here. Uh, so the volumetric variation establish different relationships directly to the yard activity. You can see how the volumes start having different orientations towards more intense areas, but also have a different, more quiet atmosphere when it faces the park. The third one, the smaller one, um, compress the volumes, and with that, it starts getting higher. Uh, it starts, as we said before, piling the buildings one over each other. Uh, leaving the ground reduced uh, to even more local uh, activities. We can imagine gardens and small ateliers that share a very active corridor. To conclude, this framework offers a set of tools uh, where the four boroughs, in this case, can use a common starting point that does not depend on one authority. Instead, it reads existing conditions and adapts them to increment the intensity of employment lands, giving power to outer boroughs without losing the chains of value that these enclaves can generate when thought as a network, manufacturing a new learning landscape. Thank you. Thank you, Eduardo. Is this working? It is. Okay. Thank you. Um, an ambitious 19 kilometer long territory. Um, who would like to start with comments? It's four of you. <laughs> yeah, me. Uh, thank you very much, Eduardo. I, I think, for me, what, what, um, there's some persuasive um, uh, drawings and, and arguments, but the, the, the missing uh, element is, is, the, is the, the pedagogical bit, the, the, lear the learning aspect of the, of the proposal. Um, I see that, as we look at the Wendell and the, and the stratification we get in the horizontal, looking away from it, um, west, as we see, in this drawing, um, I see the residential, and then I see the plates of, of industry. I see car parking between them, but I don't see as strongly as I would have wanted to um, the, the integration of the two, actually, and the suturing of those with with the educational or learning philosophy that you, were, that, that you that you started to um, explain at the head of the presentation. That's one thing. And the other thing is just understanding from, from the jury's perspective the, con the condition that you find when, when we're approaching the site. I'd, I'd really like to know more about the context that you're layering these things onto. Um, that's not just a, you know, a smearing of development across, a, as you said, Dominic, a massive, a very big region of, 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 um, of, 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 of urban space. Um, which I think we should probably now should be more surgical about, thinking about what is there, does it really need to go, <laughs> and is there a way to weave your idea into existing structure and infrastructure? I suppose that that, that touches a sustainable um, agenda as well. Those are my initial thoughts. Thank you. Do you want to respond to that, Eduardo? Um, yeah, maybe I wasn't that clear, and probably uh, I will try to push harder this idea of uh, the housing combining also these learning uh, devices in its ground space, but also in these kind of uh, volumes, uh, as I showed here, that start to become also part of this learning landscape. And I think that uh, yards here have this potential to become uh, experimentation grounds outdoors, 
uh, a big part of my uh, research was based on how we can learn outside and what are the possibilities of experimenting in connection with landscape. And I, and I agree also that uh, maybe I can use uh, better um, images to show how these uh, yards uh, can be connected with the grounds of the buildings and create better relationships. Yeah, I mean, I think, I don't think Eduardo was implying that it's a 19 kilometer long development corridor necessarily. I think that the diagram is trying to understand the opportunities, what dimension brings, and exploring. Obviously, he's raised these kind of, these two exemplars of when they come close together and far apart. But there was a discussion around clustering and, and how the housing and the sheds and the, and the yards come together. Mm -hmm. But obviously, that, that could be articulated a little bit better. Um, so I guess the, 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 the geography is a, is a kind of disruption in the city. You know, the, the, the river and, and, and everything around it is a break in, in the city. And so I guess the question is to what extent, although you say you're, I think you're saying you're seeking to integrate it into the wider city as well as provide these various uh, um, conditions of, of living and working and learning. But I, I, I wonder, I mean, in, in, I look at this image, for example, and, and I see something, uh, in a way, I suppose, a bit like a seaside. Mm -hmm. There's a group of people living in apartment buildings overlooking the water, and then there's a, a series of things that happen behind it, um, and they're less valuable because they can't see the sea. Um, so I guess this question of, in a way, it's like, it seems like it's um, almost slightly ironic in that it, it, it seems to be problematizing the problem as opposed to addressing the problem. I suppose, to some extent, it, it depends on to what extent you see the city and places where people live and work as, uh, and learn as radical or familiar. Because on one hand, the water is this, you know, we have huge nostalgia for water and we appreciate it as these, these industrial kind of wastelands of overgrown and waterways are, are delightful things. They're sort of delightful because they're not inhabited and then of course they're forces for regeneration. So on one hand the water is an easy uh, sort of setting or something but perhaps I mean there's like, the, to me there's, the curious thing is that you, you don't deal with what's on the other side of the high street i.e. what's in the foreground and so this kind of question is, you know, of, of to what extent this is sort of polemical and radical and provocative versus um, something which I suppose, you know, is more integrated uh, and therefore having happened is not necessarily something which is the cause of much debate. Um, and the absence of what is n more normal and not addressing that, is, it, to me, is, I, I'd be interested to see how you would... Um, contextualize this in, in its real context. Because in a way you're dealing with it as an abnormal condition and working with it in a way as a fairly isolated proposition. You're, you're exploring ideas within it, but not really exploring ideas of, of how it deals with its wider context. Mm -hmm. I guess that's my first take. Eduardo, do you want to come back to that? I'm not going to answer no. to everything. <laughs> I think I sort of follow on from that loosely. Um, well, well, first of all, I thought your urban strategy I really like. I thought it was really interesting the way you presented the um, enclaves and the corridor, and to think about the way across gets to redistribute it. I think you know. I think I find that really convincing as a strategy, really well presented. So that was really good. And I also liked that you really thought about the typologies that need to go with that. Yeah. I think where I'm coming, following on from uh, Simon a little bit, it reminded me a bit of Pueblo in Barcelona, which I've just been to a couple of weeks ago. I don't know if you know the area. I, I've been yeah. also recently. And in a way, you have, you have this grid, and of course, you know, they, they injected a lot of creative industries and learning into a formerly industrial area. And you really have cheap by child sheds and theatres and a lot of empty land, and it's, it's really rich. Yeah. So, of course, that is premised that the grid is maintained and almost everything can happen everywhere. Mm. 
So I think it was just a question to you what, at some point, I think I lost what's a yard and what's a corridor. So I understand your logic of stratification, but then I just wonder, do you really need this? And do you, for example, doesn't the housing always need to be along the river? Or yeah. could be mm. the next stage that you have you know, a series of yards, urban blocks, fields, whatever, and then you have a number of principles through which they could occupy mm. independent leaves on the river or something like that. I mean, it would just be one more step, right? Yeah, we, we, we spoke a lot with, sorry for interrupting, yeah. uh, we spoke a lot with Larry about, and Dominic about like start changing, inverting and trying some variations. What happens if we put the housing? I think uh, I consider to put it as this uh, to put it in a very like frontal way and be very like direct with it, uh, but yeah, for sure that I was. I think that this system should start also to start making like crossovers between them and yeah and maybe be very uh, straight ahead with what is a path, what is a walkway, what is a I don't know like the conditions also of each of these bands uh, for walking and for watching and learning. Sure, but I think these possibilities are inscribed and I would, I would love to see a shed turned housing, you know, and then, you know, it's an interest to multiply these. So yeah. I think in principle it's all there. Um, you know, maybe you could also should have, could have shown some more precedents who do something a little bit like that to sure. illustrate it relatively. This sure. is a proposal. Yes. But, you mm -hmm. know, I, I think it's still really rich. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mary, you want to? It's a lovely project. Congratulations, and very nicely presented. Thank uh, you. And I love the way you've coded it. And you know, I really, I'm, I'm looking at this and understanding it as a urban proposition. You've managed to throw what I'm reading is loads of architecture into it too, and sort of talk about it. That feels like its background. Um, I agree with the comments that perhaps the distribution of use is fairly well known, and perhaps something that you might default to. You're working present day with a brief and the, the kind of drivers that you would be given through policy, etc. Um, I love the fact that it, is, it feels like it's a genuine landscape-led idea hmm. that you're developing. Um, and I think, you know, picking up on some of the comments that have already been uh, made, I, you're talking about landscape, you're talking about heritage and legacy, and bringing yards and a kind of industrial framework back into play somehow. But I also don't feel that you've, you've done that, and I'm wondering why there aren't residences pulled back away from the river, and so there's a greater mix. But I think the, for me, what might unlock that, or a sequence of decisions you might make about it, is to think about actually how it might be delivered and the sort of time-based conditions mm. that would apply to something like this because it, it won't roll out like a framework. Mm. And I wonder if I understand that you've compartmentalized it into smaller, more intimate areas that might allow you to have a very different quality within the framework, but what if you imagined it being delivered in parcels that started with heritage and how you might occupy that mm. and then where that might lead you um, yeah within your design framework. And that could be a kind of secondary layer to your proposition mm -hmm. that might then map the reds and greens and yellows might move around a bit. Mm -hmm. um, I think everything else have been, uh, has been said actually by the other jury members. Great, thank you. John, add something else? Of course you can. I, I, I'm just listening to these last comments. It, it seems to me that there's a kind of a, there's an iconography to do with function. Sorry, it, it, can you I, repeat it? Iconography to do with the function, that there's this very uh, kind of uh, poetic, car, but cartoon-like manifestation of you know, car park, industrial building, <coughs> domestic building, although not in the kind of, yeah, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a dramatic iconography of, of domestic architecture, kind of almost like a, well, let's just say, modernist constructivist thing. And, and it feels to me that typologically, if you, if you tried a typological reading of, of these things, 
then forms and spaces, then that might free you up or, or give you another yeah. way of rearranging everything. Because yeah. it's something as simple as the car park, you know, un unlike what Catherine's describing, you know, that um, part of Barcelona, yeah, but you've once all be we've all been to places where something that in the past had a use, which was prosaic, then becomes uh, a, you know, a joyful, pleasurable place. Yeah. So that kind of rereading of all these pieces or their multivalency, I guess that's, that, to me, that's what, uh, you know, that would be another iteration, like yeah. the evolution of where you've got to, which then sort of immediately frees your hand uh, um, that anything is equally good in a sense. I mean, it's a kind of very prosaic way of putting it, but at the moment, there still is this kind of presumption that the stuff at the top of the image, the water and the park, is the, is the kind of most beautiful thing to aspire to live next to, as opposed to the idea that what you make becomes equally good to live, work or learn in, yeah. in any combination. Mm -hmm. And that's when the city kind of comes to life, Yeah, I think. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Um, just. You know, well, there was an earlier question around the high street, and um, I think there was a decision reasonably early on to not not deal with the high street. I think it was the fact that we know the constraints and the um, the problems of the high street um, in terms of the grain, and I felt, I think we felt that there was um, rather than concentrate on that to actually then concentrate on the hinterland. The strategies around transformation of the high street or reorientation and how the integration of large things that can come to the high street are well known and therefore the focus is on on, on the kind of the other things behind hmm. but anyway um yeah okay thank you eduardo thank you Hi, I'm Sami, and I will be presenting a brief introduction to my thesis called At Arcadia Nomad, Reinventing the Stately Home for Digital Nomads. So advancements in the London's transport infra 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 infrastructure introduced us to Elizabeth Line, connecting the central London to the suburbs of Reading. This connection draws urban and rural closer, closer than ever before. From central London, it takes less than an hour to be in the suburbs of Reading and, and in the countryside, enabling alternative configurations of living and working. And I would argue that this could, this could facilitate the emergence of new typologies and new settlement patterns within the semi-rural and rural environments. But what is the, what is the reality today? Uh, the reality is the, the developers continue to produce these ideal suburban houses uh, which each has this own front door, own garden, own run, run, driveway, and of course a pitch roof. Um, and this is how it looks like in the plan scheme, and this could be anywhere, this is decontextualized. Um, but, but what could be the alternative settlement that I'm going to propose? What, how could the, the suburban house could actually contextualize itself? These precedents from Benson and Forsyth, Loin and Co., Pierre Davon showed us that there's another alternative way to think about the rural settlement. On my one hour train journey to Reading, I discovered this, the site of Basildon House, um, which, um, a neo Paladin stately home who, which, could possibly, um, which could possibly form a new dynamic configuration with the settlement that I'm going to introduce in this. In these, um, in, the same, in, this, in this rural zone. Its ground would accommodate new typologies and new settlements. And, um, and this near Paladin house used um, strict form, um, platonic forms of geometry. Um, and the use of one to one and a half ratio dominated both the plan scheme and the, and the elevation. So those ratios actually became tool for me to understand landscape. Those ratios defined the boundaries between um, sparse and dense, built and unbuilt, marking the edge conditions. And, um, and, and through intervening the landscape, the, the, um, this, yeah, uh, and create a contextual settlement pattern. And through intervening the landscape, the settlement could be in invisible from the house. 
and this is how my proposition looks like. I'm going to dissect it um, through, exa um, through this, with the help of these points. So in the corner, in the center at A, you see the stately home. And, and B marks where the stable and the existing car park is located. And um, D, uh, uh, sorry, on the other end, and the, the point C marks the permanent um, typology that I'm going to explain it further. Um, D and E are the t temporary typologies. And located in between those two is the same permanent one. And, um, and, the, and there are two alternative routes that, that are proposed in this proposal. So the first route is, is an underground tunnel that connects the settlements and the Basildon House together and to the ex external world. Um, so H and G marks those points where the tunnel entrances are. Is are, are. Um, and, um, and the second alternative route is, is a pedestrian way, and which, which can, you, can, you can see here. And those points, um, and, and the edge of those, on the corner of those points, an architectural incident is, is placed. Those architectural incidents, or follies, however you can call them, um, are, are um, tools to facilitate living on the grounds. And I will explain those, those um, incidents further in this presentation. To start, I want to dissect how I approached the house, the existing, existing stately home on the grounds. Through small interventions, marked in, in, in black, a third layer is added to the house. Aside from tourists and, the, tourists and um, the, the owner of the house who resides in the right wing, in this bit, um, a third layer is added. A third layer is, is the um, co-working spaces for digital nomads. The unused rooms that are marked in gray are used for, for co-working spaces. And digital nomads coexist with the tourists through, through, through these small interventions. They, um, through the use of alternate, uh, the circulation routes that are existing in the housing, uh, existing in the, in the stately home, um, tourists and, and the visitors do not intersect. They, um, and, and I believe they enhance the use of the house. Um, so the housing, um, the grounds of the house accommodate the housing. The first typology that I'm going to dissect, which is located here, is a more permanent typology. This permanent typology um, is, is, is concealed in the ground, and each unit shares a loggia with, uh, with its neighbors. And this loggia is accessed through the kitchens and, and through the slots that are, that are created in, this, uh, in the landscape, um, allow light to pour in to, the, to these loggias and the niches behind, Pos uh, enhancing the possible encounters and, and sharings in between. The second typology that I'm going to introduced to you is a more temporary one, and it is slightly smaller than the first one. Um, th these units similarly share a loggia with each other, um, but on the other side, they also share a shared space, which can function as a, as a working space or a workshop, um, depending on the need, of the need of the user. Through creating the similar slots, right here and here, a light pours into the circulation routes, routes both in the inside, both inside of the house and the and the external circulation. Located in the both side of the stately homes, the the more term, permanent typology, uh, the more te temporary typology, um, offers more temporary stays on the in this, on those ground, on these grounds. The individual living units are accessed through these shared spaces, which are shared by two or three different units. And, um, and loggias, loggias and niches link those units together, um, enhancing the formation of civic culture and, and the encounters in between, similar to the other typology that I in introduced. However, as you go up, um, the upper floor 
offers us flexible sp spatial configuration. Each unit shares a wall, and through sliding doors, they can connect to each other. Through these doors, and a um, through these doors, units can expand both ways. Um, units can ex expand both ways, corresponding to changing needs of the user. This collage depicts an elevator, um, which contrasts with the landscape. The elevator facilitates living on the ground through, through connecting two levels together, to a level that where the settlements are and to the lower level where the, the car park is. The Civic Grotto proposed an alternative way to, uh, to, um, to link stately home, the settlements, and the subground tunnel. The semi-open lodges offer the possibility of like, um, alternative uses for this space. Through small interventions, the stately home accommodates digital nomads alongside the tourists. The closed, ro the closed rooms are opened up, and the experience of the house is enhanced for both users. Through reconfiguring the work and life balance um, and accommodating digital nomads in these settlements and using these, the state home as a co-working space, a relationship is formed on these grounds. The villa serves the settlement by providing co-working spaces. The grounds conceal the settlements, um, and through the use of picturesque, in picturesque instruments, an alternative route is proposed for, 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 for pedestrians. Therefore, through enabling flexible configurations and tackling the English domestic ideals, this thesis provides an alternative approach to the settlement. I want to end this with, with this poem by William Blake. Is there a new Jerusalem in the green and pleasant land? Thank you for listening. Thank you, Sammy. <laughs> Maybe a question from the floor. Thank you. This project. What I didn't get was the digital, um, the digital nomad bit. Actually, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. what I was seeing was somewhere that if I was approaching my dotage, which actually I am, <laughs> um, it would it would be a perfect place for for that kind of housing to exist. Single story, a kind of heart. You created a ha ha. In essence, mm -hmm. the tilted plane yeah. with a little bit of kind of agriculture in front of it on that on that green space. So I missed I missed that connection between what a digital nomad is and the setting that you've created for it. Mm -hmm. um, I really love the idea of kind of extinguishing the aristocrat from the from the, <laughs> from the state of the home and inhabiting it, but at the same time I think you allowed them to live in one of the mm -hmm. wings. <laughs> which was quite interesting uh, to see how that kind of interface might work. Uh -huh. I think there's some fantastic drawings in it, and it's a very sort of bold and, and radical proposal, uh -huh. but I think it misses, for me, the opportunity for, the, for a setting for, 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 for the kind of end of life or the, 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 doge, the dotage type uh -huh. um, yeah. Living that this uh -huh. could really uh -huh. support it's uh -huh. in, in, a, in a radical way. Uh -huh. So I think I'm not asking you to change the title of your proposal, but I think there may be alternative alternatives within the structure you've created yeah. that would uh -huh. be enriching actually. Uh -huh. Thank you. Let's start, Dominic. Thank you. Thank you. 
But Sammy, do you want to come back on that? Because obviously um, it wasn't about yeah. dotage, was it? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, visual nomads were like um, really helpful for me to understand urban and rural as equal. So they created this kind of so the. The post-pandemic area has seen the rise of the digital nomads. They basically do not belong to anywhere. Um, like they go to Bali to to uh, to work, and like in the meantime, they can also um, like work and live at the same place. So, um, so my I think it helped me to understand. Like my argument here is that like I, I think rural and sh and urban should be understood equally and. Right now, it is understood as a back, like a as a leftover area, which, which is why we see these rural, like um, identityless developments in the countryside, and um, and digital nomads, through understanding, like the way the fact that, that like the reason why I referenced Super Studio work was they um, they propose an alternative living um, on on Earth by saying that. Every 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 um, human is detached from a single point, and they can wander like a nomads. And um, and this um, this understanding is what motivated me. So um, that's why I wanted to kind of yeah. Is that explanatory? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Uh... It's a very odd proposal, I think. You know, I can't quite get my head around that. You know, there's some really beautiful drawings, and you know, there's a, the, the the side plan you showed with your geo, new geometry was incredibly beautiful, but Thank it's you. just also very odd. And I think one of the points where I think it's slightly odd, I mean, stately homes are really, really undomestic. Yeah, and that's a really good thing, I think. Right? Mm -hmm. You know, apart from all the pomp or whatever, really, they're really big rooms, there's hardly any privacy, there might have been some serving spaces, but in principle, every room is large, there would have been tons of people everywhere, they would have done politics and friendships and mm -hmm. receiving people by lying in bed, etc., etc. I'm, I'm generalizing. <laughs> um, I'm not sure if I saw this generosity in your proposals, yes? Mm -hmm. and then we come to your insertions, where A, you maintain the view of the stately home, that's another thing I'm going to come on to in a moment, but you seem to have some enfilade, but I think it would have been interesting to look at the diagram of the stately home as an undomestic dwelling configuration, which mm -hmm. is effectively living, working, whatever, and you just walk from room to room to room. Yeah. And in a way, that principle would have been quite nice to see then in your plans reappearing, uh -huh. perhaps. I mean, I kind of wanted to tackle that by like by those small interventions, because like, I was aware that they're all interconnected, like they're Three routes are um, there are three existing routes in the stately home already, like, like the way the fact that you can I mean it's almost like the AA in a way, just like you have to kind of go through this room to to go to the bar and um, so like I think those small interventions kind of tackle that, and I think in the plan scheme, like the, the housing that I proposed, I think there's a variety of like small and big spaces. Maybe it wasn't apparent in the in the presentation because like I ha I had to kind of I scaled them up a bit and then maybe it lost that kind of um, it, it lost that quality. But I get what you mean as well. Um, I think. Can I just say yeah. something about scale? Because I kept thinking, looking at your drawing, I, I kept thinking about the Smithson's diagram of the Golden Lane competition where they have a really really big slab meandering across London. And I thought. I think politically I'm almost against it. You preserve the view of the big estate and all the other normal people have to be dug away. Mm. But you could almost invert that, you know, you could almost have the you know, take the diagram of the stately home, put them into slabs, <coughs> multiply them across the site and see how many of them could you get. Mm -hmm. This would have been a yeah. totally different proposal. Mm -hmm. Exactly. I'm just telling you mm -hmm. what happened in my mind and I thought, oh that would be really interesting. And then the stately home just becomes one block amongst others, perhaps. Mm -hmm. It's not what you wanted, clearly, right? Mm -hmm. But I think if you think about an urban repeatability or an urban logic, um, you know, one could have scaled it up, I think. Um, lovely project. Thank I was you. sort of um, thinking, oh my God, he's going to do it, he's going to do it, he's going to take down the state behind me. <laughs> <laughs> I got quite excited about that project. Um, because I kind of agree what you've done is you've put everyone around the edges and whilst you've allowed this sort of secondary 
inhabitation of it, you've, you've sort of, you're still kind of revering it. And I wonder whether there is a more radical, let it become ruinous or, or, or reuse it. Um, I, I also, I think that the word urban and, and rural, you've, you've, you've taken this idea of something being located in, I think, in a rural location. Mm -hmm. When you, I think, when we talk about that word as practicing architects, it sort of means sometimes that you're not so you're not dense, but you don't define the function so much. And I, I'm, I'm looking at this wonderful image, but I wonder whether there's a there's a lot of definition in your architecture, and you know whether they, you know, they're, they're buried, and I have the same concerns about that, but I. I don't really know what you're doing with the landscape and what you're mm -hmm. imagining the people who live there actually do. And mm -hmm. I think once, once they, so it's, what's the connection with the Elizabeth line? <laughs> is it, is uh, it this idea that you get off a train and because you're sort of getting, your, your, your architecture mm -hmm. looks like trains, you know, in some ways. And I, I kind of wasn't sure what the relevance of the, Transport infrastructure okay. and what that allowed in terms of the time uh -huh. Uh -huh. difference and things like that. I think it's more about the time because, like, what I was surprised when I went to this to the Basildon House, it just took me less than an hour to kind of exactly be in that location, and um, and like the trends of this digital nomads are changing in it as well. So they actually want to live closer to to their working space, even though like they don't go there, and um, that kind of that link. Like the transportation link, um, it just helps me to understand. Like helps me to rethink the rural landscape in a different way. Okay, uh, so being a digital nomad, you live here. Yeah. You don't move. You you can live and work within mm -hmm. this. Exactly. Okay, so maybe it isn't, I think I'm just questioning the word uh -huh. the term rural and what that might mean. Maybe it's maybe your project is about redefining that very mm -hmm. specifically. Mm -hmm. Simon? Sammy, first of all, I've got a question. The, the, you mentioned the typologies as one being temporary and one and the other being uh -huh. permanent. I didn't quite get that distinction. Mm -hmm. Could you just explain? Um, in terms of in, in architecture plans or like generally, how, what kind of views are you talking about? The idea that people would live there temporarily uh -huh. or permanently. Yeah. Uh -huh. Okay, so it's not, it's not that the, the, arc, the, 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 the construction yeah. has a different. Uh, yeah, it's not the construction, life. yeah. It's the uh, life of the people. Mm -hmm, there. Exactly. So um, the difference between those two is like. Um, storage. <laughs> Did you say storage? Storage. Yeah. I mean, I wanted to kind of allow the expansion of. of um, like, I wanted to accommodate the indecisiveness of the user in a way. Like in temporary housing, you just, maybe you're just indecisive and like, oh, I wanna, have a, I wanna try this. I don't wanna kind of go full on and live in this context for a bit. But then you change your mind. You actually want to stay there for a long time and you expand your room. And then in permanent, it's just like you're more committed to it and like this, the spaces actually serve that through its kind of storage spaces. It's, um, they are like, more spacious living spaces and so on, and um, I don't know. And, and things, so I suppose things like that, that, so those typologies distinguish themselves perhaps because, in one scenario, it's more like an existence minimum type uh, typology where you share more things and uh -huh. have less private yeah. space. And, exactly. And so yeah. But I mean, I think, I mean, I, I really like the project. I, th I think that the um, there's various things to delight in the way you, you've drawn, and obviously there are references to, to mm -hmm. other architects' drawings and so on. But um, it seems to sort you. Know, there's a something slightly Stanley Kubrick about that collage with the spiral staircase. Uh -huh. That kind of <laughs> you know, there's this time is playing a part. You're um, you, you've you've been you're, you're visiting. <laughs> You, you, the way it's been collaged, you, you leave everything from the past intact, mm -hmm. and so you live. I, I mean, I, I I'm left obviously with questions, but joyful questions about how I will occupy that space, um, you know, and whether I'm allowed to touch things and 
whether I kind of stand, sit on other things. So there's a whole, to me, there's a whole other side in terms of detail, in terms of atmosphere, in terms of the visceral experience of living, which you allude to in these images, and that's great. And well, I mean, I would also say make a few more images to explore that mm -hmm. degree to mm. which there's this kind of curious relationship with what's there and kind of how you yeah. inhabit it. In terms of the wider context of the, the, you know, the, the master plan, as it were, um, it seems that you, um, you, you could be creating ruins as much as you know, it, it seems that what you've built in time could be mistaken for what was there first. Or it seems to sort of fortify the site, it seems to, um, you, in a sense, give, give structure. I mean, one, one thinks of something like Castle Howard, where the architecture extends out into the landscape. So mm -hmm. actually, the, I guess what's missing in this house, I'm guessing, is that kind of extension of, of, the, of the architect's thinking into, into the landscape. And, and something like Luttians and yeah. mm -hmm. Gertrude Jekyll in a very mm -hmm. different time frame doing a similar thing. Mm -hmm. In a way, there's a, you know, it, it is, you could see it as part of a kind of English tradition mm -hmm. of, of making big buildings in the landscape and how far they extend into the landscape and to what extent they modify the landscape, mm -hmm. as well as Super Studio and ArchiZoom and, and other things. And then, you know, the idea of fortification, the idea of ruins, it seems to be that it's, it's a very, very rich subject. I think my, my sort of criticism would be that, in, again, in, the, in these sort of enfilades or these terraces or stoas of domestic space, mm -hmm. I don't quite sense the, you, what you really think it would be like to live there. Yeah, mm -hmm. What you talk about often seems to be, or illustrate, is what it might be like to be outside where you live, mm -hmm. but not inside where you live, with the exception, obviously, of, of mm -hmm. this image. So, yeah. again, that's just something to, uh -huh. if you want, keep going. Yeah, exactly. Your research and, and, and to make that, in a sense, because it's the, it's the intimacy and the qualities of, of interiority that, in a way, become most powerful and poetic in this mm -hmm. vast, open landscape where you set out some ideas because you you know you, you orientate I mean, I've got other questions like why do you orientate things where you do but it, you, you what you seem to be doing definitely even if not specifically mm -hmm. is orientating them in a sense as if uh, you know everybody who's living there is now experiencing something similar to the original house you look away you don't look at the house you're not interested in the house you're interested in the same thing the house was interested in which is uh -huh. everything else. Uh -huh. So it's that kind of extraordinary expansion and contraction between this vast, great, big, open-ended landscape and this very intimate space, mm -hmm. which is where I would go next. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks for the comments. So Hello, everyone. My name is Vili Wag, and I'm going to show you a project that takes advantage of the requalification of the railway viaduct in South London. So let's start by looking at a video that I took from the train while going past my site in Bermondsey, which is to the south of the rail line. So if you look at this, there's, this line is a very powerful line, and you see this consistency in the height. This is the rural road estate, which has this long building which runs across 300 meters, which keeps going, and it, it has this very restricted idea of fenestration towards the railway because it was considered as a barrier or a nuisance. But then we see these upcoming projects which have a different approach, which uh, this is Levitt, Levitt Bernstein's project, and earlier we saw another one. So they, they have a changed attitude towards the way we looked at viaducts. And uh, we again go back to looking at the traditional way of dealing with the rail line as um, something that, ne that was the edge of something and we needed to protect ourselves from it. So these housing environments, the social housing looked at uh, the way of uh, the morphological approach was such that it never really connected or had a relationship with the line. But what we fail to see when we are on the, uh, in the train or uh, above the arches is the life beneath the arches. So 
the life beneath the arches hides a series of culinary uh, micro-industries and light industrial spaces that are the most vibrant place which become the famous Bermondsey Beer Mile or uh, all of these small scale industries. So looking at a set of implications uh, of this line, one of the key things is the varying block sizes as the rail cuts through a across like a diagonal, introducing further questions of orientation, the intriguing rotation uh, in the way we face the river, and uh, which, which eventually creates different lines of vision while dividing the blocks in, and fragmenting the urban fabric. Well, if we zoom in to this scale and look at this idea of the existing neighborhood, we again come back to the rural road estate and we see the 300 meter long building. Uh, and it, it is literally sitting there with its back against the rail line. And it, so it, it treats it as a nuisance. But then these are the projects which we saw earlier in the video, which like this is the Dockley estate building. and which has a fresh perspective towards this condition that embraces the viaduct. Then we start to see the viaduct as a piece of integration, allowing the ground to be a shared space that changes at different times of the day. This also shows the way in which the rail line creates asymmetry in the urban area in the form of these service yards on the other side of the arches, creating creating a frontage that has freedom of light and air, and due to this asymmetry, the buildings that come on, on, on the other side can always be open uh, to like ample amount of light and air. And this creates a, a unique mobility pattern as well, which we'll look later. Uh, so if we had to reimagine this linear building and retain the morphological approach by uh, addressing the 300 meters, uh, we could face, we could now create a new frontage along the viaduct through pushing and pulling of planes that create a sort of shear, or rotate and articulate spaces uh, that invite us to think about uh, the tremendous amount of variation that is possible along the linear uh, uh, morphology. And, and it could lead to different patterns of domesticity and the, uh, which can be achieved through subtle changes. So I'm gonna show you three different ways of uh, like uh, organizing the, the living environments. The first one is based on building on the existing culinary economy that is already emerging here. And so we start to think about where the kitchen is, how big, is, how big it is, or how many people can use it, or if we even need a kitchen in some of the units uh, where we can take it away. So one of the ways of organizing is by emphasizing the collective quality uh, of the residential dwelling where the collective is separated from the units by a void that creates two types of circulatory environments. One which is more, one second. Sorry, how do you, okay. Yeah, so one which is more private and secluded, and the other one which sort of bleeds into the collective spaces, and it creates a hierarchy of volumes. On the other hand, the rotation of uh, the, the units allows a diagonal relationship with the, uh, with the void, uh, which creates a sense of privacy while still benefiting from the vertical transparency. And they can either be single or double-sized dwellings that can be adapted into the living and working spaces that allows the building as a whole to embrace future changes. This, this sort of uh, gets us back to the idea of a collective kitchen um, from Tietgen dormitory and the, uh, the kind of domesticity it generates. And it's not just a space of like just cooking, but a space where people come and it creates a sense of community. The next type explores uh, an idea of segmentation and stacking that liberates the floor from the services and houses them along with the core. This allows the utilization of the full depth of the floor plate, leading to multiple patterns of domesticity. 
Inspired by Catherine Beecher's cooperative housekeeping strategies from the Grand Domestic Revolution, it, uh, this type extends the domestic chores and creates a service floor um, at, at, at the level of 18 meters, which again, we can, uh, we can gain uh, the variation along the height. So the first, uh, the, the whole idea about 18 meters comes from the fact that we can let go of the fire hazards and we can have units which actually don't need kitchens at all. And the 18 meter uh, sort of becomes a connected floor running across two buildings which could house uh, all the services and maybe there could be a housekeeping cooperation that, uh, uh, like sort of a system that runs through uh, as a way of life. So this is uh, this level two. Uh, so this space wraps around the core creating a nuanced um, some artist studio like environment on the other hand it becomes a double headed space uh, to the south uh, facing the southwest and it creates an open plan that gives freedom to the user to appropriate the space. So this is uh, the, the way we can create modulation and sort of break uh, the consistency in height which we see from the rail, uh, from the railway, and uh, the the core is worked out to be very efficient and which can uh, leave more space for the houses to extend and uh, multiply as per needs. This is the 18 uh, 18 meter of height floor, like uh, which connects through uh, the previous building which we saw, and it becomes fluid and open to various ways of interior organization, and it sort of becomes a form of extended domesticity and builds a new culinary ecology by housing shared pantries, spaces for food preparation and cooking. And it, it allows for higher floors to, after this to like, let, let go of the kitchen and maybe achieve more density. And this can be done by providing like dumb waiters, which could at, which could literally tra uh, transport the food to your units above. So this is another way of looking at circulatory environments as a resource for collective life and making the ground as a space for local services that can be pulled up into the building. By using the ability of the linear morphology to accommodate a deeper floor plate, this allows units to get more freedom in their depth. By using a consistent module of four meters, the structure holds ability to connect a series of rooms that can offer a wide range of unit sizes. This type becomes a spatial configuration of elements that, are, uh, that, uh, that can accommodate events that become a part of our everyday life, nesting smaller spaces on the ground, and uh, whereas the uh, leaving room for, again, uh, the collective spaces to bleed all the way to the edge as we go higher. The ground becoming an extension of the life under the arches. Uh, it becomes a place for the local culinary resources to integrate with the housing and the street stops be becoming an edge and it, instead it becomes a part of uh, the vibrant system. So by rethinking the street structure and mobility patterns, the block extends to the other side, utilizing the asymmetrical nature and creating a loop of services. And by introducing a set of parallel linkages to the interior of the block, uh, what we can do is to release the pressure of all the mobility systems acting on the main interface between the building and the viaduct. So as we see from the other side, from the, from the arches, from the viaduct towards the building, we now begin to see a transformed uh, culinary economy, a new way of life, uh, a new approach which is not secluded from the traditional approach of the viaduct, which is close to the current patterns of, uh, of our evolving uh, ways of life. So in this way, the viaduct loses its rigid nature and starts to become a resource for not just the residents but a wider uh, uh, wider for the wider neighborhood and the extended depth of the arches uh, it breaks the idea of monotony of the rigid line and it blurs the the over and it, it overcomes this weakness which uh, was there in the previous decisions in the way we looked at uh, the buildings that were in close proximity to this line Thank you.
Thank you, Billy. I'll, leave, I'll let Lee have a break from some <laughs> starting. So who would like to, to kick off? Yep, Katrina, did you just do that sort of? Auction <laughs> house. Thank you, really interesting. Um, I really like the idea that you th think collective housing with um, infrastructure in conjunction and show different ty um, type of morphological variations. I think it's really, really interesting. I'm not sure if I could follow it as well as you set it out. You know, that's a very pragmatic comment. You know, I mean, I think some color-coded diagrams would have been really, really helpful. So it took me a while to figure out, you know, when you had the core and then you had the extended space next to the core, I had to look very closely where it is. <laughs> so just to understand that, you know, yeah. I mean, you know, uh, I really like your ideas. But I think because I was really try I had to try quite hard to understand what's what, you know, what's, what's you know, what are the, the scale of collective facilities and what does it mean to the domestic unit, to the old, you know, what do they share, what they don't share. And I think, you know, it would, I would have liked to hear more about that. And also because I think what seems to be implied is a continuity from the, the space under the railway platforms to the road falling into the building and then there seems to be a gradation of different collectivities, which I think yeah. is really, really rich. But I could not now recapitulate what's where in your scheme, but, but I think that's, you know, that, that is really a minor thing, and I guess if I would read your thing, I would probably understand it. Yeah. I think uh, maybe a question for you, now that you've done these three different strategies, um, could these be at all be combined, or do you see them as very specific? Um, are, they, are they three different formal solutions, or could you re no. deploy them in conjunction? Yeah, they could always be deployed in conjunction. In fact, two of the two of the buildings would uh, that's the way they work. Like the floor actually connects them, so it's they they could still have the freedom of building uh, their own way of functioning. But and that's the beauty of having this length. Um, and on the other hand, it's the, the the point is to not have this one whole building, which could create again uh, a wall like nature with a strict organization. But the uh, so the three types could always work in conjunction and they, they could actually benefit from each other because one type has shared pantries and it's, it's always like, you, that's why the floor is connected. You can go and the idea is to nurture this, this lifestyle where instead of ordering at midnight, you can just go to the pantry. So yeah, uh, it could always be connected. Yeah, yeah I think that's where I see the richness. You know, there always could be like a kit of parts where you can see if you configure it like this, then you have so much shared space and so much yeah. the all variations. Okay. Yes. <laughs> um, I, I think this dealing with the railway line severance and trying to deal with that is amazing. You know, we, we as as a practitioner, you kind of often deal with different compartments and you just have this, if only yeah. moment, we could kind of make these things happen. So. This bigger picture is really refreshing to look at because it's the opportunity that we're kind of always looking for. I was desperate for a section too, I have to say. I'd done yeah. something coded that would have just paced us through it. I think um, this idea, so if I'm reading it in the right way, you've, you've identified this opportunity to connect, aside from the, the, the railway line, this sort of opportunity to connect a kind of marketplace with housing. I think it's very clever that you've identified that you could actually do away with kitchens and make spaces that would, 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 could survive once you've made that very positive connection. I was kind of desperate to hear culturally what that would really mean, what the, what the food would be and how the, that might inform the kind of spaces that you create and what the architecture would become because of that. Yeah. And then the other thought I had was more of a cliche actually, but whether you could also grow the food to, to facilitate the marketplace because it's, it looks like, pardon me, you're creating a new structure, a new way of living because that you're wanting to tap into the, the, the industrial environment. Um, but also as an extension of that, maybe there's, a, there's an economy that could, could grow off that as well. Yeah, yeah. But well done, lovely project. Thank you so much. I, I agree. It's, it's 
great. It's also really nice for those of us who, who draw by hand to see some well executed hand drawings. They look, they look fantastic. Um, I think um, what I'll add to from the previous comments is, is in terms of balance of, of, of approaching this at ground, at ground level is there are two sides to the arches actually. There's the kind of shop window, if you like, at the interface, but there's also the, as we see on this drawing, the, the service, the, dirt, yeah. the dirty side, if, yeah. you, if you like, which I think needs addressing equally, because that, that is kind of problematic, and how, how would you improve that condition? The other thing is, having been down to the site fairly recently, actually, um, is the relationship and through a section, as we've just heard, um, to the track level, yeah, and how kind of dominant that plane tracks is, yeah, and how the the housing that's 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 raised above that level reacts to it, yeah, how it accommodates the noise, yeah. pollution, how the immunity faces it or doesn't face it, and the engagement with the track level, having kind of yeah. conquered lots of the issues at ground floor, yeah, would be really interesting to see. And I think there's a drawing missing there actually, yeah. And an, and an explanation, an exploration, which again would uh, would enrich the, the the really interesting proposal you've got. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. Um, yeah, some very beautiful drawings, um, and I, for fear of repeating a few things, but it, again, the section. But what I th I mean, it was interesting where you started because you started with the film, and I can't remember whether the film had sound, but if it didn't, it would be interesting to have sound. And then it'd be interesting to uh, make a film from a flat, or looking at the tracks. Yeah. And then it'd be interesting to make a film down the street. Um, and and because I perhaps think that there's a different sense. And, and Lee mentioned it now that you know it's the noise. So there's um, you know and it's a you know the the, the rail line is a huge disruption in the city because of its you know. It kind of makes navigation more complicated, but, but also noise. And so I think, you know, for me, it would have been really interesting to have got to grips with the noise, to, to have been quite scientific about noise levels. Hmm. Because I think that the noise levels down at street level are probably lower than they are once you yep. get above the tracks. Um, and, and there may be other properties that are intrinsic to being in, round, and underneath uh, and next to a viaduct, and you know, there's a there's a great scene in a film, uh, you know, the Blues Brothers, where they live in a flat, and you know it, it's just I guess it's you know it's um, they're just renting the flat, and uh, it's you know, the whole the whole thing shakes furiously as a train goes past, and and it's a you know it's a coded way of telling you that they're kind of yeah. sort of on their uppers they. They're you know, kind of on their last legs commercially, and hence the, the narrative yeah. begins. Um, so, I mean, I'm, I'm not so convinced about this whole thing about co living and co housing and shared space in relation to the, the viaduct. I think I, uh, I mean, it's a, it's a plausible place for it to happen, but I'm not sure that it's really justified any more here than anywhere else. I just think that. Uh, that the kind of, that, that, you know, in a way, turning really the paradigm is the science, and at the moment we become, as a civilization, we're becoming increasingly intolerant. So regulations and codes are, are starting to suggest it's almost impossible to live, work, or learn anywhere near noise. We're actually, perhaps, as a kind of research contribution, it'd be really interesting just to kind of, you know, a lot of science is is abstract and incomprehensible, and you know, people just lay the stuff out and say you can't do it, you can't do it. But actually just saying, this is what it sounds like. This is what it sounds like at 7 o'clock in the morning, 9 o'clock in the evening. This is what it sounds like the weekends. This is what it sounds like when on strike, yeah. wherever it might be. And, and producing something that's empirically plausible. <coughs> and then that leads you on to Lee's question about what's it really, you know, how, how would you uh, um, adjust the fabric and depth and properties of the facade to begin to ameliorate the perceived or actual problem. So it's sort of understanding the problem which, you know, and then 
going about addressing that problem. And then from that comes an architecture. Yeah. Do you want to respond, Billy? Uh, I, 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 it's okay. Like I, I have uh, more graphical material, but I haven't put it in this, which actually talks about the heights and the, the level at which the living actually starts in the building. And I did give that a thought, uh, the idea of layering of the fenestration, uh, the way we treat uh, facades in a, in a condition like this. And especially while actually walking around in this area, I, I also realized like there are times when it's really dead quiet and then suddenly a train comes and everything shakes up. But um, I think uh, what justifies the idea of creating collective spaces here is the fact that when you have something collective, it is something which is so transparent and which is not, which, which you don't really, uh, like you wouldn't be complaining if you have, like if you're cooking and okay, the train goes by, you, you see something, it's like, okay. But uh, that's why the, the, the organization of the uh, units is such that they are not in immediate vicinity. And uh, it's sort of the, the hierarchy of spaces is such that you're not directly, um, of being affected by the noise. So the idea of the voids, the creating different layering of corridors, it's a, a way of addressing this condition. But yeah, I, I think I should have had, uh, added the section, yeah. Exactly, one of your typologies does yeah. address it, and actually the, 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 the um, types of space, not types, not necessarily the right word, but yeah. the activity, that whole communal space is a buffer in itself, isn't it? So yeah, yeah. That, yeah, is is kind of that's the strongest of your three typologies. I yeah, the most most appropriate. It's yes, as yes, a, you know, yeah. And from as, it, yeah. that further architecture evolved, whereas the other two seem coincidental, as it were. I suppose. Okay. Yeah, I think you know Billy was taking on that three hundred meter long <laughs> building and, and and the idea of a linear morphology and seeing how segmentation and layering could bring a new kind of quality, um, but take, you know, sort of really front on, sort of addressing that, that issue. But yeah, I think you just obviously edited the, the presentation a little bit yeah. too much. So, <laughs> but anyway, um, anybody else would like to add something? Because we've got a few minutes, that, so we can extend the time a little bit. Sorry. Some of my colleagues. Oh, have you? Sure. One, of, one I always think when I'm looking at co-living proposals is would I do this and maybe giving too much away about myself but I usually conclude that I just couldn't, you know, I'm probably not sociable enough. So I always want to see or understand what it is about it that would make me want to make that leap. So I understand things about not living in a permanent house and renting for a bit. You know, we've all done that and that kind of being de-shackled of certain kind of responsibilities about looking after your own house and that, that yeah, structure. Yeah. But the bit about in this, having to go up and down the stairs to get the food, to, to go to the kitchen, I think I'd want to love to know that I'd really enjoy that bit and understand that I could still escape to a compartmented place. You know, I think those kind of more intricate and intimate conditions about how you experience and live in an environment need to be explored too. Yeah. Thank you. So if there's no more questions from the floor, we'll move on to Rashida. Thank you, Billy. Thank you. My name is... Um, Rashida Momo, and um, yeah, the title of this is Last Mile Urbanism. Um, so we know that along our waterfronts is typically where we accumulate industry, which means that barriers within our urban areas is doubled. Not only do we have the topographical barrier of the waterway, but we also have business parks uh, and logistics parks um, that become part of a wider area, preventing integration of other services. Oh, sorry. 
as we, as we think about requalifying these areas that were once peripheral but are now central, such as the Lower Lee Valley in London, we ask ourselves, uh, what is a way to generate value? We know that housing is a way to do this. However, what we tend to do in inner peripheral areas is build housing through high density tower blocks um, that further the discontinuity um, while ignoring the possibilities of integration with industry. Uh, we can start to think through working from home, new patterns of distribution, and um, thinking about an active ground that isn't dependent upon retail, but rather on the kinds of civic opportunities that emerge from a productive process. We might imagine a new type of logistics ecology that through aspects such as storage, distribution, attention to light, and micromobility allow for the integration of industry and everyday life. Its extension and layering of linear and warehouse typologies across the landscape ensure the permeability we need uh, within our cities to move goods in and out while also extending living environments uh, uh, near where we make, distribute, and store. In London's Lower Lee Valley, two strategies are implemented within industrial employment lands to bring porosity to a fabric filled with discontinuity. The first strategy um, recognizes uh, the braiding that happens along the A12, this motorway, um, the River Lee that cuts sort of through the center, and uh, the Leeway, which is um, green infrastructure that's being brought in, um, both vertically and horizontally. And this produces large irregular forms um, that, uh, that are near their edge, um, that, are, uh, that are shown to be broken down into a serialized set of, um, of parcels with linear housing, with linear housing along the edge um, to provide frontage to the river and large warehouses on the opposite sides. Uh, the second strategy recognizes that interior to employment lands shown here. Um, this tends to be a little bit tighter with smaller warehouses. So the stitching and parcelization of the landscape would need to occur through an even thinner form um, that frames the new connections created for micromobility. These two strategies are brought together to form a framework, framework that not only transforms employment lands, but stretches across the infrastructure to transform the urban area. This idea of deploying multiple strategies for regenerating an, uh, an industrial area is seen in Hoffen City in Hamburg, um, where in black you can see that, um, in the diagram on the top, you can see that a series of forms provides uh, both frontage and continuity to the canal um, and form a recognizable edge for the area. And uh, another strategy focused on the center provides a, uh, a gridded system that holds a variety of forms and sizes. This, uh, these strategies enable variation at the ground level through ramps and, um, and stairs so that a variety of leisure activities uh, can be supported. Play environments and green space are also able to be introduced in such an oncology. We could think about moving things around uh, a lot closer to the site of production while also retaining the living qualities um, that we desire. The clothing industry, for example, um, provides thousands of jobs throughout London, and thus we could begin making, distributing, wearing those goods while living within that productive ecology um, that contains the typological and architectural in interventions that supports the spatial variety needed. A gridded yet open floor plate with the introduction of an atrium, as seen in the yellow building by AHMM, allows for fostering a connection amongst businesses and workers um, of Monsoon, a textile company. Um, within the ecology imagined, one, could, uh, one would be able to live in a dwelling and view adjacent office or production space through gallery, um, gallery access, and they would be able to, um, or they would be able to view that activity in an adjacent building. Uh, an atrium space could uh, also be thought to provide a collective housing 
uh, experience um, fostering social relationships through an inner street that holds garden space as seen in Le Bazin Flow by ANMA in Bordeaux. In section, uh, light, is light is also introduced into the uh, building through double height openings, and the ground would hold the the ground floor would hold the storage and uh, distribution and lobby spaces for for residences, while the middle level would hold the dwellings and the top would house offices, nursery, um, workshop or production spaces as well as dwellings. Uh, stacking of distribution and production and education space within a warehouse typology um, frees the ground and allows for the introduction of, of other environments adjacent. In the dwellings, sliding walls help achieve the flexibility needed to provide the live-work relationships for makers imagined, um, where one space could be closed off to separate the messiness of the home from video conferencing, online consultations, clothing production, or other maker activities. Double height dwelling typologies enable the introduction of a mezzanine level that could support a workspace separate from the home um, or the expansion of family over time. Through these architectural elements, we can conceive of a warehouse space that has an abundance of light that comes from the top um, so that light is filtered through the stacked education and production um, and manufacturing spaces um, down to the storage and distribution spaces on the ground uh, in the inner street within the residential environments that's raised off the ground floor um, becomes a structuring element that enables the integration of office, education, um, or even nursery space um, open to the surrounding neighborhood. Current, uh, excuse me, current pro, uh, zoning practices related to this, uh, to the demand on land are a main prohibitor to facilitating an ecology um, such as this. From inner city areas such as Kentish Town, um, where living environments are being placed on top of existing warehouses due to the lack of available land, to peripheral areas such as Barking, uh, Riverside, where housing and industrial areas become uh, large enclaves, the policies and frameworks um, proposed don't enable a long-term vision. Inner peripheral areas, such as the Lower Lee Valley in London, um, contains conditions sim seen in, um, in both of the city and the periphery, and uh, that makes it an interesting testing ground. Um, and some of the conditions it contains are those sort of high density um, housing developments you see in the tan, and then the, the large employment lands here and here that are being, um, that are meant to be re retained. Um, so yeah. Rather than separating urban areas by function, we should think more about the way we can bring these things together through a contracting authority, which could um, be called a super zone. If di distribution is the shared surface, an active ground could contain a choreography where at its edges, large trucks are bringing in goods that um, then transfer to sm smaller vehicles that begin to move throughout the area while toward um, the river and along its southern edge, residential activities are possible through the uh, introduction of green space um, and the adjacency to water. Um, something such as a super zone allows us to, bring, uh, to rethink elements such as bridges that are a micro-mobility micro element uh, tying separate parts of the uh, inner periphery together. We would also be able to take advantage of the redundancy um, that's seen in these areas um, and the meanwhile tactics that show us that these are areas that people value. <laughs> Typical road bridges tend to undermine the variety of traffic we want to see but uh, as seen from the foot bridges in Copenhagen, we can start to think of bridges as part of a last mile ecology. Um, we, could achieve a, we could achieve a networked um, working uh, system um, that has the service and leisure environments we want and a mobility system based on um, the idea of getting the modal balance right. Um, and this also could change the types of buildings that are incorporated uh, and deployed and the characteristics of our waterfronts. 
We could also think about hybridity as seen um, in bridges such as the Green Mile Bridge in, uh, or the Green Bridge in London's Mile End um, that bridges over a motorway and uh, is part of a larger park. Uh, or Somerset House in London um, that uses the bridge as a passage to connect public space. Um, we can also think about um, a bridge recognizing the river as a high street and acting as an extension of the building it hugs um, and also as a way to extend and create uh, access deep into employment lands that become less permeable as you move um, into them. So through attention to um, typological interventions, hybridity, light, and micromobility, we can begin to requalify industrial lands um, that have the legacy of making, distributing, and sorting so they um, can hold the living qualities that we desire for a multi-scalar live-work ecology. Thank you. Thank you, Rashida. Can I ask a quick, just a quick question for myself? Is the relationship of those two uh, on the right, is that a plan that floats above a ground, or are they both grounds? Wait, I'm sorry? The... These two here, is one actually projected away from, is an upper level of what you're seeing onto the right? Wait, this one? Or yeah. this would sit on top of this? Is that oh, they, they stack. Yeah, like there, there are two levels that are shown here that are stacked on top of each other, and this would be on top of, these are the two levels that I'm imagining would host um, uh, production or education spaces, right, okay. and that's on top of a distribution facility yeah. right, or you. storage um, area. Who likes Rashida, I think these are absolutely beautiful drawings. Oh, thank um, you. And um, I mean, they're, they're beautiful irrespective of what they illustrate. Mm -hmm. But given what they illustrate, I think what they convey beautifully is this, um, um, I'm going to say tension. Anyway, the, mm. the, the challenge of uh, bringing sort of large structures, mm -hmm. um, accommodating, uh, you know, things which are quite pragmatic, you know, whether it's vehicles turning and things being stacked. So mm. there's a there's a deep order and logic mm. to the buildings, but then they flex uh, and they uh, poised. They're poised in relation to the geography mm. that they're set in, and that that kind of um, this kind of articulation of a fundamentally a sort of largely orthogonal, but every now and then it breaks with that logic, and you one gets this really strong sense <coughs> of these buildings. They work. Mm. <laughs> But also what they then do is they create really interesting spaces, inside and outside, um, and, and, and also kind of uh, in the way that, I don't know, something like a castle or a monastery or bigger structures mm -hmm. have a beauty um, because of scale, but also um, their sort of capacity to uh, engage with landscape. Um, I think the, the challenges are, uh, or at least the thing to me that's missing, mm -hmm. which is simply just perhaps an, another step, mm -hmm. which is um, this kind of immersed experience of yeah. being within right the space, in the buildings, yeah. and right in the street. Mm -hmm. Because it reminds me, you know, this whole question about the hybridity. There's no question that we're, you know, there's a lot of people thinking that this is a a good thing, mm -hmm. it's sort of the only way to make sense of many aspects of a city. Um, I would recall, and this is a kind of cliche, but that thing where if you get up early and you, you go to a um, vegetable market or fruit market and, and then around that there's cafes and, and bars, partly because the people who work there need to have breakfast, but then of course they realise that other people turn up. So there's, there's, a, um, there's a way of life mm -hmm. that, that um, animates that part of the city because mm -hmm. of the activity of distribution and, mm -hmm. and um, wholesale kind of, you know, sale and, and, and yeah. purchase and so on. So that means that the, the, the things that you're going to distribute there need to be sort of tangible, uh, good thing, you know, yeah. engaging things and the yeah. kind of classic, you know, various forms of 
food markets, whether it's meat markets, mm. vegetable markets, so, you know, they, they, they are actually really positive, mm -hmm. uh, at least traditionally, really positive uh, kind of bits of the city. So I guess that's, you know, how do you, how, as opposed to distributing boxes of mm. electronic goods <laughs> mm. or something like that, which nobody really takes any pleasure in mm. being anywhere near. And the last thing, I suppose, is the temporal, the, the, you know, because this is, if it's going to be really successful, this is spaces for people, but it's also, if for it to be really successful, it's spaces for vehicles. Not a novel observation and not a novel challenge, but actually something uh, to be sort of addressed in, mm -hmm. in, in the work. Yeah. Which you might have done, and you didn't yeah. share that level of detail. Yeah, I, um, I had, uh, oh, sorry, let me talk here. I had done a, um, sort of a, a study on the, uh, on the ground, um, which I'd shown in a, a sketch, um, and I transferred that sketch into a, a digital drawing that really looked at how trucks are moving, how smaller, like the range of mo vehicular movement throughout. But then I started to lose the, um, the qualities of the living environments, which I think has always been the challenge in, in this project, is how do you bring all of these vehicles together while also retaining the living um, aspects that we desire? So I think I just need to sort of continue to look into something like that so I can yeah, ensure that this, um, this work sort of has a great balance of, of both. Um, and yeah, I'll leave, I'll leave it there. Um, yeah, it's interesting that, you know, you, you talk about the, the, the way of life again, you know, something that keeps coming up. How do, how do we put that across? And I think, you know, Lee, you were talking about nice to see the freehand drawings. And I think you see it here as well, that the challenge of trying to deliver complexity and at scale, an overview, and then trying to bring that quality of life through mm -hmm. in the drawings. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we have to go back to a freehand drawing to get that kind of vitality yeah. and that immediacy and vibrancy that you get in the line, which is difficult yeah. within the, the, the rendering. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, that's a thing we've seen a couple of times this morning. Great project, Rashida. And I, I, actually, you. I just wanted to talk about drawings for, for, for a bit, mm -hmm. which I agree with, with Simon. This drawing is, is, is really super strong, and but actually could be stronger in a way. I mean, just some practical things like push the stack further off away from yeah. the ground plane so mm -hmm. you can see what's going on. Yeah, no, that You're makes sense. You're confused about what it yeah. is, actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's one thing. Your hand drawings, again, were superb. But they, they also had texture, they mm -hmm. had texture in them. Yeah. And I think what would enrich the drawing we're looking at now is is, is have the ground plane texture of mm -hmm. put some of the life you had in your three dimensional stuff. Yeah. And and, it, and actually you're just you're, you're, the pure plan that you had mm -hmm. was also very, very rich, which would enhance this um, massively. Mm -hmm. um, what so what I think is missing maybe, mm -hmm. maybe to, to complete, if there is any as well, is the is the ground floor the, sti the stitching together of the buildings and mm -hmm. what what's, what does stitching together? So the spaces between the work the workshop and the, and the housing. Mm -hmm. You suggested in some of your precedents there's um, there's multiple plane mm -hmm. amenity mm -hmm. uh, and play actually yeah. you were demonstrating which yeah. would be really good to see. Mm -hmm. um, so a yeah, great <laughs> great hard line drawings super strong. Could be influenced even even more by by referring to your hand drawings, which yeah. are really really skillful. Too. Yeah, thank you. A bit about drawings. Um, I think something that I'm really interested in, something I'd like to to see, because I really believe it. I think it's great. Mm. I you know we we struggle with master plans. You you set a vision. It has a time frame, and when you are delivering something that has mixed use, you can imagine it coming up in parcels. Mm -hmm. But I think something when you're involved in a master plan as a practitioner and you obsess over is, let's say you're delivering one parcel, what the conditions, you mentioned meanwhile, I know, but the conditions around your building might be a hoarding for 25 years mm -hmm. or something. So mm -hmm. I think it would be interesting to see this perhaps broken down, perhaps as a really simple timeline. Mm -hmm. And you could suggest or harness an idea about the, the kind of starter project mm. and how it might roll out as a, yeah. as a project. Yeah. Just, to, just to 
explain I think that's one explanatory diagram that, mm. that you need to, to give this that kind of level of belief. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. I think I also have a question to follow up. But I could be very well that I have understood it. I, I think I quite enjoyed your domestic studies when you spoke about, you know, how a flat would work so you can work and live and, you know, the protection of things was really rich. Uh, I hadn't quite understood then how that is then articulated in the scale of the urban block, but I could have missed that. Mm -hmm. And also, is there ever a moment we have living integrated in these mobility sheds? I'm not saying the right living. Thing, mobility sheds, but they're sort of education and production. Or are they separated? Uh, they are separated. Um, did, so did you try it out? I didn't try it out. Um, I, even though you know, I, I am clearly like seeking integration, but I thought that the, the I guess I didn't necessarily think that there was a, a need to sort of put all of the functions in one building. I thought that the area itself could become a little bit richer if it's a little bit more dispersed versus all under one roof. But yeah. I understand. I think yeah, I don't mm -hmm. know the answer to that. You know, yeah, I don't fair know enough. enough about these, you know, these mobility functions, how much space they need. But I think be, mm -hmm. be interesting that the next step yeah. for somebody else, if you you were to take it further, yeah. Be, yeah. could they be integrated, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. or do you end up then again in those big square production double height stacks versus <laughs> education mix? Anyway, you know, mm -hmm. it's not a criticism. Yeah, just yeah. Just something to think about for sure. Yeah. yeah. But again, we also mentioned before, but really well presented. Oh, thank you. you know, also with the logic, and most of the students this morning was really nicely presented. And you know, sometimes I always tell my students, never say, and then I did. Mm -hmm. you know, so it was none of that. So it's really interesting to present an argument, and it was very convincing the way you spoke about that. Oh, thank you. So we're nitpicking about your drawings and other <laughs> things, of course. But, yeah, you know, yeah. Really nice yeah. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I'm Jay. Uh, new housing assemblage for people in need of daily care, as well as a community for knowledge exchange that promotes lifelong learning with multi generational groups. Also, the courtyard morphology argues for its capability of promoting integration of working and living environments and housing assemblage as catalyst to generate urban transformation of knowledge culture. We live in a culture, time, and place where aging in place plays a key role when talking about our living environment. The issue at hand is people require different levels of care are not always present in the family environment. The major shift in how we deliver the care is not only about care receivers and caregivers, but about how we set up the shared responsibility, learning, and trust within the community through everyday participation. And correlated it with how we think of the future of the knowledge culture, taking advantage of the fact that there's already a strong network of people employed at the creative industries and here is area. What the architect could do is to looking for ways of retaining that talent base and convert it into a more extensive neighborhood with wider population and generations. And we shouldn't forget that beyond that employment we need, it's also a community for caregivers. So everyday life, everyday services associated with their families can be facilitated so that we can imagine a continuous professional research and development happening in time and forming a community for key workers to have social exchange and improved facilities. And the new actor to de deliver such a model should encourage a cross-disciplinary cooperation between care provider, educational institution, and housing developers. When we look at the future master plan in Hackney Week, there's a kind of approach to a morphology that was dedicated by the London Lexi plan, which was heavily based on the idea of courtyards and streets. While the newly built housing on site can be regarded as the missing opportunities, 
The double-loaded corridor, the isolation with art studios, and the ignorance of the canal. And it's not happening in one case, but a pervasive problem. The pursuit of form is killing the possibility of the beauty of the, the where the beauty of the courtyard morphology lies in, the ambiguity between the interior and, the, and exterior. And through the typological research on the courtyard morphology, we begin to understand the gardens, courtyards, and plazas that make up a rich configuration of the ground. With the terrace and external gallery surrounded, the content courtyard and associated with learning activity on one side could cr promote the socialization. And what if we push all of these collective elements in the center and private elements on the outside? The hierarchy is created in the center and they are addressing the larger civic environments. And the idea of how a looped inner street as the evolution of the double-loaded corridor can adjust the context with public programs towards the urban side and allows for the movements in the in-between space. And even the semi-open courtyard, the continuous route around the yard offers a threshold between the landscape and the research space, which also act as spaces for meeting and thinking. And we actually want to take this morphological pattern as a starting point to demonstrate its ability to integrate itself into the multi-layered space, more than just a care environment, but associated with intergenerational care, mutual learning practices, and R&D research. The notion of an inner street integrated with differentiated courtyards is shifting our attitudes towards a system of care could actually work in an open, flexible manner. The R&D situated in the center act as the armature and ensuring the service living environment by participating in our daily lives in different tailored care facilities. The intergenerational care home organized around the content courtyard is a basic for building the floodly involving relationship of association and care. When the children's playground is physically open to the surrounded facade and terrace, it created a strong visual relationship and the courtyard works as a three-dimensional landscape. The community center managed by the local concert is replaced by a new program promoting participation and proactiveness within our living environment. At the entrance, the culinary school and the workshop open to the public comprise the frontage of the pathways, ensuring a, a private and quiet space towards the canal and the residential side. And the upper floor redefines the external gallery as an extension for meeting and the gathering, and enlarge and set shared resources at the corner. What if the learning activities can be integrated more closely into the core living life? Through the typological imagination, the collectively living environment shows a radical configuration of shared grounds and services. The different learning activities as daily rituals are presented to each other through central courtyard and shared with family living in the tower. The everyday fragments of communal life are organized, arranged, and displayed through the extended grid system as an avenue to explore a new kind of collectivism among the elderly living with the students. And how do we imagine the semi-open courtyard combined with living and working could have the conversation with the wider creative clusters on the opposite side of the canal? Here it offers a civic plaza active by the community activities like cafe and restaurant, as well as art-related workshops and it also utilizes the canal to accommodate waterfront activities, enhancing and extending that kind of civic grounds. While the shared collective life and working and research moments are manifested as a cityscape, when we look at the assemblage as a whole, we can see how the form grabs completely different attitudes towards what's the most we can get out of the London Lexi plan, not three, but as a whole. The job opportunities 
Educational landscape and care services are something that flows through the notion of the multi-layered ground. An inviting city integrated common grounds is closely correlated to the immediate context. So we see how the hierarchy created as the canal front and extended to the northwest through the theorists of learning activities and the courtyard providing daily care and outpatient for the community. And in terms of orientation, it shows how the care facilities based on the courtyard morphology can enrich the street life. And when it leads to the upper podium, a continuous learning ground managed by different departments, enhancing the social mix and intergenerational interaction and extending our imagination about interior urbanity. And the roof as a second layer provides additional offers like sports facilities, civic plaza, outdoor workshops, and roof form. It's more than just a service living environment, but as a civic avenue, a gallery for displaying learning practices a space where group, local groups meet and a base for neighborhood initiatives. It's more about democratizing housing with a mixture of different ages, generations, classes, and it helps to set up a re relationship of mutual respect, care, and trust. And when we think further about the area-based synergies with the knowledge quarter, the project indicates the way to reconcile and integrate into this post-industrial area, which coexists on both infrastructure and low-rise residentials in terms of the scales. The roof shape, color, and material considerations are inspired by the industrial infrastructures on the site. Moreover, it offers an approach to regard assemblage as a practice embedded in society and city. An awareness that assemblage can be a catalyst for urbanization and reconstruction of the society. We can imagine more ambitious development will take place at Hackney Week to enhance the network of creative industrial life correlated with lifelong neighborhoods. And we could also rethink the changing position of the canal, the large shift from economic value to the culture and the environmental values associated with what we're doing yet, which provokes us to redefine the identity and means of the historic elements to be the new canal landscape. What's more, we can think critically in terms of the diagram developed from the courtyard morphology. The adaptation to the higher density broadens the discussion about versions of why such a diagram should matter to us today. When the perimeter goes higher, the idea of the multi-layered ground and the ambiguity generated in the in-between space still remains our memory and fascination about the courtyard morphology. And finally, all it shows is the mid rise driven housing assemblage under the Lungan legacy plan but its typological shifting allows us to constantly respond to the care environment and take it as an adaptable framework to integrate working and learning as well as civic environment. Urban everydayness can be interpreted as a continuous negotiation between common grounds, patterns of participation, and shared responsibilities as a general question linking domestic city to the question of the urban area. That's all, thank you. Thank you, Xi. Open up to the floor. Got to start. Um, wow, really exciting. I mean, I, I was listening to everything that you said and I was just, all I could think was, you're kind of taking all of that living anxiety away. You know, you, 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 you start living somewhere and you move to another house and you have a pension plan and then you have to look after your parents and all of those things could be resolved through a project like this where everything can happen in one place, this kind of idea that 
you can live in one place through your life because you've accommodated lots of different kinds of activities. I think um, whilst your drawings are really clear and the idea is so strong, I would have liked to have understood a bit more about how those particular concerns associated with mm -hmm. multi-generational housing are accommodated kind of across the, 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 the life of the building or the life of one occupant. I think that might have been a really nice way to just sort of summarise the, the scheme that you're trying to promote. Yeah. But perhaps also, you know, because this is an incredible piece of research and, you know, you just really want it to mean something and to be something that can be eventually adopted and translated into something. And I wonder if there are drawings that you could do where you could describe what actually happens and how housing and how different kinds of living accommodation are procured, how the public spaces are sort of compartmentalised and exist in other places, mm -hmm. how you could maybe show that a scheme like this could kind of hoover up all of those things and they could be kind of delivered through one kind of programme. Yeah, thank you so much. Well done, it's a fantastic project. Thank you. Great to see that someone's dealing with multiple generations. Happy to continue. I also really, really enjoyed that. I think I really, really liked your plans particularly because I thought it gave it a real richness, you know, not necessarily architectural, but almost like a, yeah, as a type of morphology when you showed the actual plan with the shared platform and the users. And I think it was really interesting to see the, the, the amount of space given to the residential units and then the, the shared corridor and then on the other side the platform. I think I really like the particularity. I think that was really, really nicely done. So I think it's a really convincing proposal. Um, despite the fact I like these drawings, I think they're, I'm really interested in the diagram. This is not really a criticism of that, but I think there's so much going on, you know, it's like, you know, so many different articulations, everything is staggered, you know, and I think if you would have more time, I'd be really interested to see maybe just one or two pages of a catalogue of the type of pro the, the type of morphological possibilities mm -hmm. of that. No? Because yeah. in a way, one of the issues where I felt a little bit looking at your 3D work was it almost becomes now a bit more like a superstructure than the idea of a semi-open block principle. Yeah? This is, mm -hmm. again, it's not a criticism. I can see it could be easily adapted. But right now here, of course, I'm always sort of tacked onto the form rather than the principle. Mm -hmm. So I think it'd be really nice, you know, remember housing and urban used to do those quite a lot of catalogues, right? So in a way, this is an example that we'd have loved to see the catalogue of the possibilities of, you know, how many different units and how, how open could it be, how many platforms do you need, and, and even sort of maybe square meter areas, you know, the, the balance between what's shared, what's collective, how, how, how deep is the multiple ground versus the residential areas. I mean, it, it has all this potential. So again, it's not at all a criticism. I think it's a really nice proposal. And if it then looks a bit like the barbecue or not, you know, hey, hey, you know, it doesn't matter so much. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, it's an incredibly strong scheme, I think, with the sort of very sound principles um, to start with um, and a sort of it's, it's believe, unbelievable, and the sort of informal, the three, the three courtyards, the enclosed courtyards, and then the, the, the courtyard that opens up to the um, to the Lee, I think is a great proposition. Um, the, the sort of casual or informal arrangement of the three elements is 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 really strong, uh, but there's so much to take in. I feel like we need another um, you know day probably to to get into it. Um, because of the, the, the layers that you've, that you've managed to, um, to um, research to start with uh, and to explore and then they're explicit in, in, in very... I, I, I really like the drawings actually, I, I, think, I think they're great. The most interesting aspect I suppose is the, is the extreme which is the relationship of, of, the, of the, the way that students and, 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 and senior living works and that mm -hmm. interface. Yeah. So I think in doing a really big scheme like this, which is which is incredibly intricate, 
I think to study an element like that in detail and explore it kind of quite close up um, to explore how that works. Maybe mm -hmm. that's the, the way that that, that, that that plays out over a day or over a week, I don't know. Uh, would be really interesting to see. So to explore in a bit more scrutiny on that mm -hmm. particular aspect of, of a very rich scheme uh, would be great if there's any time left for you yeah. on this. So congratulations. Thank you. Yeah, it's a beautiful piece of work. I'm, uh, can I say like Lee, I'm not sure I'm going to do this justice. Maybe that's not fair on Lee, but <laughs> I'm not sure I can do this justice. And I would like to read what you read uh, slowly. Um, I just a question, first of all, those three typologies you refer to fairly on graphically, mm -hmm. um, which related to uh, generational and living and education, you apply all those three typologies. That's correct, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, for me, I, I, yeah, I, I, you may have done them, but I think it'd be really interesting to see a set of diagrams which I'm not sure whether they're, because um, in my head initially they would, they'd be sort of plans, diagrams, but, but I think it's interesting, so you've got morphological differences, mm -hmm. you've got figurative differences, and you've got um, sort of functional or activity-based differences, and that kind of correlation or difference, you know, you've effectively got three dimensions of manifestation and I'm mm -hmm. not sure whether they correlate or in fact you use all three to make multiple uh, you know, uh, multiple variations of, mm -hmm. e of experience um, and if you do I think in a sense there's you know, it, me I, I'm sort of left with this very strong picture of this place in the city but not the time to fully understand the sort of complex ways in which I think you're using these devices, uh, morphology and figure, and relating those two things to activity. In other words, getting all those three things kind of sp spinning at the same time in multiple different ways and different parts. And then, um, <coughs> and then I, you, there's, a, there's a kind of festive quality, which I think is really interesting about it. It's like, it, it feels inherently joyful and that may be partly to do with use of colour and the way you draw but it's also the way you actually assemble mm -hmm. pieces and there's there's a um, um, an, an ad hoc I mean you know, there's moments of absolute order and then there's moments where you, you you just start assembling things and that's a really kind of perceptive I guess dimension of life isn't it that, that there's a kind of baseline of um, order and time and predictability and certain things and then there's what uh, creates a, a joy and unpredictability and actually capturing these, you're being especially open in your creative methods and your manifestation or illustration of what building space and architecture can be. You're, you, you, you're that, it's, you, it's, it's not singular, you know, it's, it's got a depth which many, mm -hmm. kind of a bit, I'm going to say, a bit like playing chess against yourself, is actually quite hard to, to be a number of, to, to, you know, to evoke a number of different existential, because in a way, you know, even though it's architecture, it's in the end a form of kind of existential expression mm -hmm. and that comes through really uh, well in the, in the work. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Do you want to respond to any of those at all? No, thanks. <laughs> We've got some time, actually. Thanks to the expediency of the students' presentations, um, we can take the floor. Yeah. Larry. Um, I, I hope you'll forgive me, G, for putting you, um, for, for what I'm about to say, but um, in looking at your work, I am struck by the journey together over two years. So I, around this time, two years ago, I was looking at your portfolio from your previous school. Mm -hmm. And you showed one of the most sensitive judgments about 
uh, space and form that I had ever seen in an incoming student. But your project was relatively simple. This one is unbelievably complex and you still handle the synthesis in a very compelling way. Now, Katrin has pointed out that <clears throat> now it would be nice to take it all apart and see the catalog. Mm -hmm. um, and I think th this is actually something that helps us think about a way forward for us. And, and I think through these comments, we're learning a bit about next steps that we can take. But what I do really value is the degree to which you've taken on uh, a tremendously complex brief that you've given yourself and brought your synthetic judgment to bear on that with the same, uh, the same kind of conviction and resolution that I saw in a simpler project two years ago. So, beautifully done. Thank you. Thank you, Larry. Welcome back, everyone. Uh, we had an absolutely delightful morning session, and uh, we're looking forward to an even more exhilarating afternoon. Um, the, the, the projects that we have coming forward continue the themes that we began in the morning. And, and just for our new jurors, um, Pierre Davoine and shortly Christos Passas, David Cohn, um, we will, I, I just want to remind everyone of a few things that we said this morning. Uh, our, our view of urbanism is that it starts with a project that has enough power to begin to nurture or initiate a transformation of an urban area. And it does so by harnessing the drivers of change. And so there are these three different aspects of any of the projects that we, that we do, where we're trying to think geographically, we're trying to think architecturally, and we're trying to draw upon what we think is bringing new possible value to a current moment. Uh, so within that, as you can imagine, it gives a tremendous scope for students to select their own lines of research. The range of possible projects is as infinite as our field enjoys more widely. And we do not try to restrict very much the student briefs. Uh, that said, there are recurring themes, which you will n notice. But we also don't restrict students to a particular style. Uh, but we do ask them to investigate through drawing, through graphic means, the way in which they can better understand how architecture might open up a point of view about the way in which associational life can transform how cities work. Now, I mentioned also at the, at the beginning um, in, this morning, another aspect of our work is that we tend to discourage a sort of predetermined polemic. And so we don't predefine the lines of research that will lead uh, students to investigate. Instead, architecture is to be thought of as something that opens up a potential conversation where, in a way, future disputes can be imagined and perhaps anticipated through architecture rather than closed down from the beginning. Now, the, um, what I think you will see in all of the work that follows is that students are using a project to open up ideas. And sometimes the resolution will feel fairly definitive. But it's really the questions that are more important to us than a definitive or well-resolved solution. Now, th this afternoon, um, we have with us new jurors. Um, in addition to Katarina Borsi, Lee Bennett, and Simon Henley, who will be able to remain at least for a little while this afternoon, we also have joining us uh, Pierre Davoine. And I have to say, I am especially delighted to have you here, Pierre, because actually when I first arrived at the AA more than two decades ago now, one of the first people I was introduced to by my colleagues, uh, Hugo Hensley and George Fiore, was Pierre. And at the time, Pierre was very much involved with the school. And I am so delighted that you're back to being a part of the school. But 
And uh, in Pierre's own right, his projects are known for their subtlety, for their feeling, for sight and material. And he's been an inspiration to many generations for being able to think architecturally about how to transform a landscape and a, a living environment. Uh, so we we're, we're, we're look forward to your comments. Now, we also uh, have with us David Cohn, and David, in fact, has agreed to join in with the Housing and Urbanism program, and so today is actually his first chance to really see some of the work, uh, but David is going to participate with uh, Housing and Urbanism uh, going forward, and so you know we'll be looking forward to this uh, introductory meeting between your work and ours. And David's, again, David is another, like all of those who are participating in our design workshop, who has uh, a rather, um, let's say, experienced understanding of the world of practice, but brings that together with uh, a, a feeling for the discipline. And what we are really delighted about, David, is that you have this kind of understanding of um, sort of initiating a project, seeing it through, leading a practice, using design judgment, but doing that in line with an understanding of the broader field. So welcome, and I ho hope you enjoy this. Now this afternoon, uh, uh, the session will be chaired by my colleague Anna Shapiro, who's a partner at Shepard Robson, as almost all of you know. And um, Anna has been uh, sort of, um, for many years, the, the person most driving the transformation of the design workshop to what it is today. Um, so we are very grateful and really delighted that she could make one more session with us before she has to take a slight break for uh, <clears throat> the emergence of new life. Uh, <clears throat> but the, um, uh, we're, we're delighted that we could time this so that um, Anna is still with us today. Um, now, the, this afternoon we will see five students, very different projects. Uh, Anna will chair this, and the, the first of the presenters is Sarah Cope, uh, who will be taking us to Stevenage. Uh, and um, it's not the sort of place one would normally imagine one wishes to go, but that's exactly going to be Sarah's point, is that we probably should. And Anna, I don't know if you want to say more of that, about that since you were no, directing it. I wouldn't it. repeat your introduction. Okay, no. all right. Anyway, Sarah, please. Over to you. Hello, good afternoon. My name is Sarah Cope, and today I will be presenting an introduction to my thesis titled Collage of Parts, a framework to mend the fragmented fabric of the new town, allowing micro shifts towards a collective domesticity. Stevenage, like many other new towns, seems to have lost its shine, or did it ever have one? The new town, a utopic master plan for suburban garden city, was designed to relieve London's congestion. It was self-contained, providing housing, industry, and commercial spaces, everything you could ever need and more in the 1950s Britain. But this utopia quickly turned dystopic with more car parks than people evolving into a discarded zone, a salvage yard of developer-built housing and massive steel sheds, contributing to a loss of, loss of identity and a loss of the individual, all forgotten somewhere in the underpass below the M1. Stevenage is incredibly well positioned between London and Cambridge along a tech corridor. It has attracted attention for its affordability and connectivity. A small-ish city or a very large town it is almost ex entirely accessible by bike. The train station dissects the city, connecting individuals who live there to London and Cambridge in under 30 minutes. The only problem standing in its way is who wants to live in a salvage yard. The current strategy of development in Stevenage, a denser commercial center, and the limitless growth of, a sing of single family homes is a solution that isn't sustainable and isn't really improving the sense of identity. However, I believe embedded within this unremarkable place holds a remarkable potential to challenge and experiment with the way we live on the suburban periphery. Beginning with the industrial sheds that litter the landscape, 
This proposal will investigate how these massive voids in the urban fabric can be re reconsidered and fragmented, a patchwork of actors and stakeholders who actively participate in the alteration of their environment. The shed can be ripped apart and put back together again as a collage of textures and programs, both temporary and permanent. Collage may evoke memories of a messy desk, tiny bits of paper that compose a final work of art. It formulates a composition that is neither permanent nor consistent when repeated. One shifted piece can alter the fabric of the image, altering our perception of the composition in front of us. It is an activity that ranges skill levels, from a primary school art class to a professional artist studio. Anyone can collage. This, through collage, this void has the potential to evoke a layer of disorder that structures the continuous participation of urban actors, resulting in a typological change in the way we as architects consider housing in the new town. Senate describes this value of disorder in the city as it contributes to an open feedback loop, identifying ownership, sense of place, and purpose through a patchwork-like configuration of textures and territory. It is a system that is multi-scalar, starting with the individual and challenging the compositions of the city. Rowe furthers this argument through Collage City, describing the city as a texture that results from fragments brought forth by various actors and elements. In plan, this patchwork configuration is annotated in the changing materiality and textures of the roof plane, sheltering the disorder that is contained within the shed. In this proposal, using the work of Senate and Roe as a starting point, the active participation of urban actors reconfigures the landscape of the industrial shed. The industrial shed is designed to be incomplete, a structure that, is, that can adapt to changing industries that move in and move out. Given, given limited restrictions, in a series of phases, the industrial shed is spliced and transformed into an activated landscape. Housing activates the shed, and then once the actors have settled in, the transformation of the landscape introduces meanwhile activities and events. Beginning with DIY housing, the structure of the shed, the six meter bay, serves as a strategy of parceling individual units. At the ground floor, the edges of the parcel define an ambiguous ground. Units can be either shared or isolated, but aim to encourage a continuous plane of collaboration to promote a sense of civic, collective civic identity. This emphasis on self-built housing encourages a community of makers, a textured facade that is solely defined by its users. The texture of the facade, the identity of the neighborhood when walking down the street, results in a physical manifestation of the hands that built it. The parceling resulting from the bays articulates an interplay between facades and represents the different families or communities that live within. A variation of identity and freedom to build constructs a reflection of oneself, a draw that is incredibly unique in comparison to more regulated cities like Cambridge or London. The party wall, defined by the shed's existing structure, serves as a consistent boundary between units, creating modules that can be conjoined or kept separate. Thus, the living space inside can vary between communal and private, based off of the needs of the individual. The maker space at the outer edge of the ground floor becomes a threshold, an extension of the street. The facade merely an expression of the collaboration and production that occurs as a community. Within, the maker space is connected to housing above and adjacent workspaces through a core that punctures the plan with a communal courtyard. This courtyard introduces light and air into shared spaces. Housing then allows for the opportunity to introduce a community into the void that once was the car park. After the development of housing, the center of the shed allows for meanwhile activities and temporary structure. The rigid frame of the shed allows for the flexible adaptation of interior spaces. These spaces are defined by a textured ground, challenging the interplay between solid and void, industrial shed and car park, hard versus soft, dark versus light. These textures define different meanwhile opportunities, such as a pop-up concert or children's play. The ground is defined by a continuous surface rather than a hard edge. The voids left behind by the shed and the car park evolve into a park-like infrastructure. This park infrastructure continues to connect other industrial fragments within the periphery of Stevenage and can evolve and adapt as the needs of the community change, introducing more permanent fixtures, such as an office space or a skate park. 
This, the shed relies on the car park to achieve continuity and extension in the assemblage. The interplay between these two spaces works in an acupuncture-like strategy for regeneration in the new town. At the scale of the town, these individual communities act as civic nodes of extension, connecting individual parcels with the town center and beyond. The housing that borders the edges of the shed acts as a catalyst for the development of future growth. The shed's proximity to the train station is significant as it connects Stevenage to London and Cambridge in a 30-minute train ride. As a result of these existing mobility and biotech industries, development of more housing is crucial. It is critical to understand how this new build housing will transform because of a collective nature of DIY building and meanwhile activities. Rather than the traditional single family suburban dwelling, which is currently the solution for affordable housing and results in endless sprawl, the sense of experimentation within the shed can radiate to influence the new build housing that will inevitably occur. The traditional mechanism would be to introduce housing at approximately 35 homes per hectare. As a starting point, this proposal will include 75 homes per hectare. However, this is just a preliminary number and one that would surely evolve over time as the new town changes. Building upon the needs for affordable housing solutions and the collective engagement that occurs within the shed, this new build housing will investigate how varying degrees of collectivity within the home can provide a more affordable style of living. Utilizing shared utilities, patios, and flexible use common spaces, this new build block defines a sense of neighborliness through the things in our lives that we share. The north block is configured by two mirrored units. These units compose a semi-communal floor, almost like a semi-detached home. Rather than a party wall separating two individual units, these units are brought together by a widened hallway. The space services the apartments and introduces more room to unfold your clutter like parking your bike or storing your Christmas decorations. It acts as a mini street, the communal activities of a neighborhood like a barbecue or children playing in a cul-de-sac occurs at the communal floor rather than the outdoor street. As an extension, the unit has a private living space alongside bedrooms that border the edge, the living area which always stems directly from the communal hallway and includes a double height space connecting the unit with the neighbors above in a similar strategy to the sh shed, the unit plan is punctured by communal access to light and air between floors. Spaces shared between units ground the corners at each floor, providing laundry facilities and flexible use common space for residents. The South Plan is designed to challenge the traditional constraints of multifamily housing. To introduce an even more sustainable and affordable housing solution, this strategy relies on a series of micro-modules where nearly everything but the bathroom sink are shared. It utilizes a four meter span to allow for timber frame construction. The floor itself can either serve as a unit or be split into two separate dwellings, depending on how many people you want to share with. Micro ensuite bedrooms on the edge provide individuals with private space but their modular structure allows them to be conjoined and accumulated for additional space. Building on the sectional strategy seen in the industrial shed, this introduces a sense of adaptability within communal living. A drummer might want an extra living space for their drum set and not to annoy their flatmates. These private microspaces rely on shared utilities and responsibility for collective environments. Each floor as a self-contained neighborhood shares communal circulation space and laundry, as well as a patio that borders the edge. Together, these blocks identify two different collective conditions and provide accommodations that shift to meet the specific needs of residents. The life of actors is dynamic and changes in response to different generational markers. The cooperative deep block is adaptable and anticipatory of changing needs and micro shifts in domesticity. Affordability is achieved through inexpensive materials and adaptability of structure. In response to the micro shifts in the way we live, the housing block needs to be reconsidered to adapt. The current strategy for building in the new town is problematic and unsustainable. The condition in Stevenage isn't unique, but rather contributes to a larger discussion on how the undesirable back of house peripheral city, how to make the undesirable back of house peripheral city exciting. Through the adaptation of existing structures, participants can shape the suburban environment in a continuous feedback loop, redefining the texture of their environment into something that is participatory. 
experimentation through the collectivity and materiality can redefine the way we live was altering the trajectory of the new town into something experimental and worth investing in. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sarah. Who would like to begin? Pierre, would you please present? <laughs> So I really enjoyed the presentation. Um, I'm slightly deaf, I think, <laughs> because I, I didn't pick up everything you were saying. But I, I think I got the spirit of it, you know. I'm, and um, I, I, I know Stevenage um, because I nearly got involved with Stanhope's about 25 years ago when they were looking at that. But, but you know, sadly that didn't come about for me. But I did make visits there. And, and the thing that really struck me was probably, I think, what you were talking about. There's a sort of a sense of, um, you know, optimism and anticipation in terms of what Stephen Lynch as a new town aspired to be. And then, then there was a gap. And, and, and the state it was in the early noughties was, was, was not quite um, what it was, um, what it maybe should have been. And I, I think part of this conversation for, for me was about the, um, the way the centre was dislocated from the hinterland by, by the road system. And the centre was, um, for me, kind of, um, yeah, it was cut off. Um, but, but so I'm, I'm assuming with your, with your proposal, which has an optimism about, you know, the, the, the kind of post-industrial quality of this space and, and, and these found structures that, that would be um, reinvented. And I think that the, the kind of process of reinvention that you're proposing is very interesting, you know, um, the, the, the way that you might put combinations of, 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 of people, um, with, you know, like create, create scenarios where, where different kinds of demographics and groups of people might come together to live. Um, I, I, yeah, I mean, the, the, and, and the idea of it being a kind of collage, I mean, the, the, the questions I, I, I wanted to ask, you know, I suppose are to do with, with procurement. You, you talk about affordability, and um, that, that, that's, you know, that, that's something that maybe there's a sort of parallel strand to, to the presentation where the, the, the more lyrical, Way you're presenting is 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 is, is sort of um, or complemented by a, a, another kind of um, reading of how you're aiming to put this all together, um, you know, and that that would be something that would interest me. Thank you very much. I, I think it's great, Rogers. I think what Peter is talking about in a way is is, is the how to get the process across because if there is participation, if one takes hold of the, the shell, uh, then how, how is that designed? How is the process designed in a way? Mm -hmm. And how, how does the designer or the occupant engage with that? Um, I think it's really sort of stimulate believable project in, in, as well actually, and really stimulating asking all the right questions and extremely optimistic mm -hmm. um, in its outlook. It's also great that it's, as we talked about this morning, kind of outside, <laughs> outside <laughs> London. It's very predictable that we do the projects in London. It's really interesting that you've, you've, you've taken on the, um, the, 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 the prospect of, of dealing with issues in, in, in Stevenage. And, and Stevenage is replicated, isn't it, all over the country. There are many Stevenages. So, um, congratulations on that approach. I think in, in the weeks you've got left, I would just explore the idea of, of designing the process mm -hmm. to give this sort of constitution more, more weight mm -hmm. and, more, and it, it, it deserves it because I think it's, um, it's got so much potential. Thank you. Um, it was very nice to be here, given that this is my first visit of, of many. Um, beautiful drawings, 
Thank you. Um, very beguiling. Watercolor. It looks like watercolor. Maybe it's a kind of digital watercolor. I don't know. But um, the yeah, this question of questions, I think, is is where I would want you to go. Um, in that, I was not very aware of Stevenage, mm -hmm. and. I was not really aware, given the, the kind of sympathy, sympathies of your project, I wasn't very aware of how your project relates to Stevenage. Mm -hmm. And tied to, the, to those questions are questions of who owns the site, mm -hmm. to what degree is this speculation, and it seems speculative, and it seems quite technocratic because the language is very sophisticated. I think, I mean, it, it was fast, very uh, kind of uh, technically saturated presentation. And again, I'm, I'm wondering, the beauty of the drawings perhaps hides that, that there's, not, there's no other type of representation that might unpick some of these other questions. So, um, I mean, there are lots of great precedents for types of development, like Fide Comiso in Buenos Aires, and I think there's Adamo Fiden, super interesting. Um, there's Baugruppe in Berlin. I mean, in the UK, um, there's also discussion around custom build. And again, there's a kind of question of how does your proposal relate to these precedents? And a lot of the invention is to do with funding models, reducing planning risk, whose risk is it? And I think, again, your sympathies are with the occupant in that there was this kind of group of, you know, the word community was there a lot. But the degree to which, I mean, I suppose bar groupers are quite celebrated because those, the people that invest in it live there. And that, these questions are, I think there's an assumption that there's almost like beautiful drawings, mm -hmm. happy lives, but there's a lot of stuff that, that are kind of difficult, actually really difficult questions, and they're slightly intractable, and that, that doesn't mean that, I'm sure you've got, you know, the way you talked about the project, you could apply the same um, kind of richness in your thinking, but to these, these questions that, you know, if you can unpick some of it, that, that's amazing, because, you know, these, these do feel like sites of huge potential, but um, yeah, the, the worry is that they are sites for just pure speculation. Um, and all of this work can very easily get co-opted into that model. Mm -hmm. so. um, it's yeah, lovely, wonderful, Thank beautiful you. project, beautifully drawn. Um, and and it, I mean, I, I, you know, I've never, I don't think I've ever been to Stevenage. So <laughs> I, haven't, I haven't seen that version of decay for a while. I mean, it, it, it slightly reminds me of a kind of post-war London, not that I experienced it, but through photographs. Um, but it's a different fabric. So where the fabric of London after the war is, is a fabric of kind of ruined brick and you know, fallen in slate and timber roofs, there's this other version of um, wasteland um, and um, with that in itself as an aesthetic uh, to harness is really interesting to sort of, well, what, precisely what you've done, I suppose, is evoke these thoughts for me and, and where that leads you is a, um, what, what struck me about it was it, it, it uh, I didn't think of it as a place that you would consume actually, but as a kind of something more of custodians. It was so, so awful, not your work, but the place, that I couldn't imagine a lot of speculation. All I could imagine was, was kind of custodians, um, you know, and, and hence a sort of temporal presence. Uh, and I, you know, I don't know um, whether I, hopefully I didn't miss it, but I got that sort of, you know, I have a question which is in a sense, how does it evolve? You know, not that it gets denser, but it, people just kind of live there and move away and new people move in and start 
you know, reiterating the, the usefulness of, of the structures to make space. And so um, you, 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 there's a kind of potential suppose, dialectic between pure construction, useful construction, and kind of scenography of, of kind of versions of domesticity overlaid on an, this kind of industrial wasteland. But all of which sort of suggests to me that it's, it's a very refreshing way of, of envisaging how people would live. You know, so that the kind of the image of house is so fundamentally, or home, is so radically different. So it's yeah, fascinating. Thank you. Thank you, Simon. Katharina, would you like to add? Yeah, thanks for that. I really enjoyed the domestic configurations, the way you organized the plants. I thought it was really beautiful and really rich. Um, I think at some point, graphically, the shed seemed to be disappearing. Mm -hmm. I mean, in many of your drawings, you know, I looked at really interesting configurations of cooperative and co-housing, whatever, and the shed became less and less visible. You know, I mean, and I'm not, I'm not, don't mean this architecturally as a problem. I think I understood you had the party walls and the six meter distance and things like that. But I think uh, in a lot of your drawings, you re it always felt like the next step you were relying then on the actors. You know, so, you, so you had this configuration and then there was this gray space and then you would ha always have to rely on the actors to activate that. Mm -hmm. yeah? And I'm just wondering, despite the fact it was beautifully drawn, I just thought maybe could it be to extend that project, could you think about what happens between the shed and the railway or could you take that as a strategy what happens rather than having a series of three sheds which are co-opted by a certain kind of actors. Could you go across the suburban landscape? What would happen then, et mm -hmm. so, so I think in a way, you know, always referring back to actors only, I understand that is inherent in the logic, but there's also danger if you don't have these actors or that funding mechanism or that Baugruppe set up, nothing will ever happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so I think I think I was missing a bit to you know to scale it up yeah. as a principle, which might be the next step. Maybe it's just something you can think about. Mm -hmm. You don't have to draw it all up, but just in, in order to think about it. Yeah. Or you just declare, well, these are variations of cooperative housing as delivered by a pre-given system as through the shed or something. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Uh, so Sarah, I think you are encouraged uh, to respond to sort of more prosaic questions about process, uh, land ownership, time, procurement, all the difficult things because in a way, if we are persuaded, we want to know how to act, mm -hmm. what, what to do tomorrow to make it happen. Do you want to maybe comment on that? Yeah, I mean, I think if I see for myself this almost like next phase, right? Like almost like an index to this thesis. I would om come up with a kind of loose zoning set of diagrams that kind of outline these stakeholders that are kind of coming in, outlining different use types, being like very much more specific because I mean, I think there's a lot of this was just like building the thesis. But I mean, what could be really interesting, I think, is like, how do you, I mean, how do you subdivide that shed? Is there like a one hour fire rating between walls? Is there like a kind of alignments of where roof kind of cornices hit? Is there a kind of pitch requirement? How do these things kind of really, like what is my role of like outlining a diagram? And I think, I think, I think what would be really a set of interesting diagrams um, would actually to be like, and I know this from New York, but like the kind of New York City zoning strategies are very kind of minimalist, um, but they kind of allow or outline light and air requirements through like a really set of simple diagrams. And I think what would add another layer to this, because the drawings are so active that if I kind of came up with this strategy of zoning that also includes a strategy of who would maybe be interested, because I think it is something I looked into in terms of um, uh, like the existing biotech clusters that are here. Currently these two sheds that I kind of used as a starting point is actually um, a, it's a, like a, like a kind of, um, like a college for um, people who are learning in different industries, so kind of welding, construction. Um, but the shed itself is actually subdivided into different stakeholders. So one of them is a kind of 
place, I think it's a tile workshop, or one might have, so they're existing, there's already kind of a fragmentation that's happening exist, like within the shed, um, and I think all of these sheds that I've highlighted all have very different industries, so I think I can begin to kind of like add that as a, another layer. One of the questions you were asking during the final weeks of uh, putting it together was, is there a need for a design code for this project? Could we think about working on a vision of this sort with a design code in mind? Um, and perhaps this kind of, the answer was delayed. We, we were encouraging Sarah to delay a definitive answer to this question. Um, maybe some of the jurors would want to reflect on that. What, what are your thoughts? No. <laughs> if not, I would invite Irene, maybe, to comment on the project. We have at least five minutes, Irene, so that would <laughs> cover it. So another, so we just, um, I just come last weekend from a shed conversion into a house um, in Devon. And the critical thing was a, was a change in planning law that allowed you to convert an agricultural shed into um, residential uh, permitted development. And there are certain kind of strange rules like you could only have up to three dwellings, you can have more. And the largest dwelling couldn't be bigger than 5,000. It's 5,000 square foot. Um, so, you know, if you had an enormous shed, you're kind of scuppered. You know, so this is quite interesting. And um, I, again, I think if you're able to build up the argument around these constraints that, that actually affect anyone practically doing these and, and set that out. And so the other types of drawing, mm -hmm. which I think you, you, you've alluded to in your responses already, you talked about <laughs> diagrams, but there's maybe tech, there's, there's text mm -hmm. and guidance. And um, it, I, I think it's also interesting, the, the presence of the inhabitant as someone that has to find their way to be in this project as a journey is, is is interesting because it's it's quite this kind of sense of a a technical solution to a, a problem mm -hmm. um, feels very much you know amongst consultants it's brilliant but I suppose if if you came from the outside and you're potentially what what, what do you do I mean, and I think um, a lot of these models in which people are encouraged to part with their money to take to, to be involved but they're not conventional, like house buying, there's quite a lot of work that goes into educating people to be able to do it. Mm -hmm. And so there's almost like a step-by-step, -step. well, I know it looks like a shed, but <laughs> you can go through these steps. And so in a way, that then becomes really useful to other people, not because of only the design being beautiful, but there's a kind of um, how-to guide sense. And that, that's incredibly potent. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. I mean, I just you know, wondering whether you know there's some, I th something missing in the presentation. It's just, um, and you may have done a lot of work on this already, which is just um, offering an understanding of the sites that you you found mm -hmm. and the ones that you're working on, and some. It almost requires a, a simple kind of building survey of, of, of the shed. And, and you talked about um, an urban code, but I mean, by, by doing a sort of, if you've done that, you could present that analysis of the types of buildings, or is there a generic portal frame? You know, is it at cost? How, you know, what period are they made? Are they concrete frame buildings, steel frame buildings? Just simple stuff like that, what are they clad with, you know? I mean, was it the age of asbestos? In which case, that's a, another kind of major issue. Mm -hmm. But what's really exciting when I was looking at it, I wanted to see a section 
And I like this conversation that you were having about this sort of interstitial space, that you, you, know, you were using the, the, the existing shed as a kind of rain screen, effectively, you just kept the rain off, and then you, were, you had a, a kind of freedom to interpret and insert your, your, your new building types within that. I think that, that's really rich. Um, potential, but I, I just think it, it needed more kind of detail for me, you know, just and maybe another kind of gear in terms of the kind of drawings that you're making. Um, you, you know, they could be very stripped back, just very clear in terms of um, what you found, and mm -hmm. then you can allow your audience to make the, the connection to what you're proposing. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sarah. Thank do, you. Do you have any further comments, or you're ready? No, I think <laughs> to so. to it's great. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So I would like to invite Johan, who is going to take us back to London. <laughs> so yeah, our next project is taking us back to London, and we are going to look at Goldfinger's Trellick Tower, and revisit what I think John is claiming being almost unfinished project. Hello, everyone. The city aims to reform high-rise housing in metropolitan cities that suffer from bad conditions. Focusing one of the most famous post-war housing, the Trellick Tower redevelopment aims to use a set of slab buildings to shape a healthy high-rise neighborhood for the culture and creative industry. The assemblage aims to improve the living qualities of the local community and help this area to become a creative neighborhood for art, music, and sports. Here, we celebrate the artists of today and invest in those of tomorrow. The redevelopment promotes future urban transformation to engage with a wider range of knowledge and creative industry actors, including the White City Knowledge Corridor and Industrial Land on the West, while improving the quality of the residential environment in knowledge-driven work areas. The current morphology of West London is formed by the conjunction of significant urban amateurs, including railways, streets, highways, and canal. The geography of the urban amateurs create the current condition of irregular blocks and grids, fragments and isolation of urban fabrics. The site was surrounded by a series of low-rise artifacts and the area is dominated by terrace housing or big sheds that fill the irregular blocks. Trilek Tower offers an opportunity to rethink the morphology of this urban area. The collective form of the Trilek Tower works efficiently to respond to the context. Facing the street on the ground floor, the seven-story housing offer supporting service to the local community. The north and south orientation allow to bring more natural light in the housing. Parallel with the railway and canal, the 33-floor housing is located on the north side of the site. The orientation of the high-rise housing allows it to have a proper distance from the noise and other influence from the railway. By setting back from the railway, it formed two different parks. One is an internal and sunken park for the residents, and the other is a canal set park for the public and the surrounding neighborhood. The redevelopment aims to improve the mobility system to integrate this area into its surroundings, intensify the connections across the, the canal. The assemblage is a composition of the reputation, variation, and accumulation of the Trellick Tower. It is a cluster of living, working, and service space of a creative community. The cluster consists of four independent housings, including the original two housing of the Trellick Tower and two new slab housing, together with two new offices. Built above the bus terminal, the student accommodation serves the White City Knowledge Corridor 
and brings young talents to the creative community. To challenge the traditional impression of high-rise housing, it illustrates a new vision of living in a high-rise, the richness of life, the variation and diversity of households, and the freedom to choose the lifestyle according to individual wishes. By building a, a cooperative, inclusive, and multi-generational co-living community that combines shared community features with private residential living, it rethinks the new domesticity in central city living. Basing on the typology of the Trilek Tower, the circulation connects three floors in the middle. The unit types varies from one-bedroom apartments to four-bedroom apartment, from one floor flat to three floor triplex. Qualified student housing encourages students to learn how to get along with others in a group by integrating and socializing decently. The three floor cluster of the student housing includes a common area for a group of eight students living in en suites, a shared kitchen with dining space, a lounge area, and other common activity space. The shared space is an extension of the main circulation and privatized living space located above and under floor of the shared space. The structure, of, the structure grid of seven meters is preserved. Compared with Trilek Tower, the units are more open to provide sharing space, not only for cross-generation families, but also for friends sharing housing. People interact through space. The spatial connection between different actors encourage the interaction between different collective groups. Jointly cared by the residents and artists who live and work in the community, the Winter Garden is accessible from both collective housing and co-working space. Moreover, the garden holds temporary exhibitions and public events for the surrounding neighborhood. The working space offers deep floor plan for large-scale creative design groups, which request collaboration between multiple actors for networking and team-based working. To serve the creative industry, the form of space needs to be shaped across how the people work in creative industry. Divided into the formal and informal working space, the variation of working space allows individuals to have productive works while also having teamwork and communication between different groups. The informal working space with the continuous vertical and horizontal circulation that links everything together creates a sectional continu continuity thus achieving an internal urbanity. Facing along the railway, privatized independent studio lofts, sheltering an independent creative space for musicians, fashion designers, skateboard shops, and other designers based in West London. In the multi-layered studio, the different functions were separate in different floors by staircase. Facing the railway, the wide and transparent facade exhibits the artworks while bring natural light into the studio. Meanwhile, the interior shelters self constrained place for artists to work. By building something high, it frees the ground. The multi-layered ground and landscape approach resyncs the ground floor and landscape of a high-rise neighborhood. To continue the same design language as the original Trellet Tower and revaluing the canal, the cultural center was set back from the canal offering a generous landscape at the canal side. The thickening and deepening ground accommodates diverse cultural and art activities, sports, and communal use. The four-story continuous loop with an open floor plan connects all the high-rise buildings. The wide opening of the loop improves the permeability of the pedestrian and the continuity of the inner park and the canal side landscape. The redevelopment project offers a dynamic ground for public events and various activities. Inside the courtyard, there is a market for local artists and flower shops. 
the small movable art box as part of the art installations could be arranged and relocated according to the needs of the festivals. Moving along the flower market, continuous long concrete walls and landscape are merged to form a graffiti park, providing creative space for graffiti artists. It has been 50 years since Trellick Tower opened to the public. By preserving the legacy and introducing more urban actors in the area, the redevelopment projects offer an opportunity to requalify this urban area by rethinking the relationships between the urban amateurs to promote the Trellick Tower transformation into a creative community. Here, we celebrate the artists of the day and invest in those of tomorrow. Thank you. Okay, who is the beginner? Thank you, Katharina. Thank you very much. I really enjoyed that. I think I, I think I need to start off with a couple of questions, and it could be that I didn't follow it in detail, or maybe there's some drawings missing. I'm not quite sure. I, mean, I really like the principal idea. Uh, of taking the Trellick Tower and redeploying it or testing how it could be, re its logic could be redeployed and you know add value elsewhere. So I think that's a really strong mm -hmm. argument. There's a part of me who thought it'd be even nice to think about the Trellick Tower itself. How would you appropriate it now to extend it, alter it? Because in a way that's a current um, problem. Anyway, but that's by the by. I think you implicitly have done that. Mm -hmm. I think pragmatically, you know, I totally understood your logic. I didn't always follow it in the drawings, but that could be just me. I think I understand the logic of the, the platforms and the multiple grounds, and I think the, uh, the collective living and then the, the formal and informal working. I think I was less clear where these realms meet. So I'm not quite sure if I'm looking at four housing slabs that sit on an inhabited platform or not. It, that's not a critique, but I think I, I wasn't quite sure um, how these different, if it's about sharing, you know, is this just co-housing and is it different kind of works and, you know, the drawings that show me where these realms intersect, if they do or not. So I think it's probably more a question of clarity. Mm -hmm. So can you maybe just go to your overview plan and just explain to us what's what? Um, so maybe so prosaic. <laughs> This, this one? Uh, the the, the oh, overview, okay. the very first yeah. image you oh, showed. This, this, this one here, mm -hmm. for example. So I can see mm -hmm. the Trellick Tower. Mm -hmm. And is, is everything pink housing? Uh, no. Okay. Um, <laughs> the long pink building facing the canal is housing. <coughs> and the other one on the left is a st student accommodation built uh, above the bus terminal. Okay. And the other two is a working space. OK, mm -hmm. OK. And the orange platforms, what do they, are they programmatically prescribed? The, the staggered ones on the river and the ones that sit underneath the uh, It is a continuous loop that connects all the buildings together, including okay. communal space and okay. uh, studios for the artists. Okay, I get it, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think following from that, I think I'd be really be interested in the intersection between those. You know, I think not necessarily programmatically, but also um, where's the added value? How can we connect a living environment such that this sort of extended work environment, you know, how do they benefit from each other, you know, mm -hmm. and what do these platforms bring? So in a way, just a bit more detail on that graphically. Mm -hmm. But I think in principle, I really like the idea, um, but I, did, I just had to follow up with some questions. Okay. Yeah, thank you very much. I, uh, really enjoy the conversation and, and the kind of ambition. I mean, for me, the presentation just needs points of clarification. Mm -hmm. um, a little bit what I said about the, Sarah's work. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, one of the things I think I would appreciate is, is just, you know, a, a, you know, preface this with an understanding of what mm -hmm. um, Goldfinger means to you. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, sometimes I think of his work as a closed conversation, you know, that, that leaves very little scope for, for intervention. But um, having said that, you know, though that you, you've kind of ex 
you know, expanded and, and found the potential to, to kind of intervene on the site. Um, and, you know, I, I think it's very clear the way you're talking about the orientation of the, the, the new parts. Um, I, um, I, I just think it, it again, it needs maybe a, a conversation that plays with the scales. You know, you may need to zoom in and you ne may need to zoom out as well um, and make very clear what is new and what is existing. Um, so that, and, 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 and maybe, I, I know there's a kind of way in which you're drawing, but I would really, for, for a newcomer to the proposal, it would be really nice to add some, some text or some mm -hmm. labels, just so that we can start to read things without you having, without having, you know, without you having to talk about those. And they could be, you know, you could continue with your broader narrative and more detailed narrative without us um, having to sort of hunt for, for, for you know, to make those kind of connections. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Thank, mm -hmm. you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I, I'd agree with where we're looking at a project of, of such scale um, with a huge take up um, in terms of the, of, of the site. Um, it would be good to understand how the scheme worked in time and over phases and incrementally. Um, possibly starting with a, a requalification of the Trellic Tower, which I think you've got a ground floor but in its substance, you know, at each floor level, are you, are you making an intervention there? I think also I didn't quite get, <laughs> I don't know the site particularly well, so I didn't really understand the, the, the actual context of what you're overlaying your mega scheme on. Mm -hmm. um, and I think when we've got a scheme of such scale um, for the jury, it's really important to be explicit about what, what each element is, mm -hmm. actually, mm -hmm. to remind us. Mm -hmm. um, and then particularly at, in terms of your, your ground, well, you, multi, you have multiple ground, ground, mm -hmm. um, ground floors in the, in the scheme, to understand how each of those is, is working and relates to each other would be, would be important in a simple diagram too in the two weeks you've got, you've got left before the final submission. I think it's very ambitious. Mm -hmm. I think it's a grand scheme. I think it's doing something kind of unique, uh, but would need more explicit diagrams to be more forceful, and it would enrich the whole mm -hmm. submission if you if you were to do that. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> I kind of realised in the previous presentation I wasn't. I should have been aware probably. There's only two weeks. Is that right? Ish. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Um, so it has to be quite kind of measured. Um, um, yeah, thank you. Again, beautiful drawings. Uh, I kind of feel like, maybe it's my, my want, but I would dial up the, the jeopardy in your project. Mm -hmm. And by that I mean, um, this is a really famous bit of London, as you probably know, and I mean, you had photographs of um, the streets that approach the tower, and they're really famous streets. And um, do you have a plan of the what's existing in your proposal in your um, slideshow? Um, I have a like three-dimensional diagram. Um. So what what I find fascinating is that I mean I don't I, I mean I probably ought to be able to situate myself better. But I find it amazing how little I understand of this part of London through your presentation. And I'm entirely reliant on my not very good knowledge and memory of this part of London. And I think that, I think it's really important that you contextualize what you're doing in terms of decades of urban intervention where there are, there are drawings of the 1970s, I think it's 70s, where you know, Soho is completely erased and there are these very, very large developments. And I think, I think they were quite reputable architects that drew them, and I think they were quite ambitious and optimistic. And there was, you know, a politics around what Soho meant to anyone at that time. And I, and I just think that there's, 
your, your scheme is, it's, it's unclear how violent it is to what's there. I mean, the colors are all very non-violent mm -hmm. and you present it in a very um, calm and you know, the, the story about who's there mm -hmm. after this mm -hmm. thing is all very mm -hmm. sweet. Mm -hmm. But I mean, potentially it's a, it's a hugely destructive project because to build that much stuff in this part of London requires a huge amount of destruction of what's there. And I think that in the, in the couple of weeks, I would really, really focus on what is there, are you able to communicate, who is there? I thought it was fascinating that there were two photographs of the site with people uh, in some kind of street market festival. One's unclear whether they remain, you know, do they, are they in your new community? Are they, does your new community um, co like involve? Yeah, it is included in the new community. But, that, it, but you see, until you, yeah. until you draw the relationship of your new world mm -hmm. to what's there, mm -hmm. and you make the case for them being, you know, yeah. it's more than the sum of its parts. It, yeah. it, it, I have to say, it's, it's, quite, um, it's quite ambivalent around these questions for, for me because it's, I can't see it in the drawings yet. So I think for me that the kind of, and I mean it's been alluded to around the time, the journey from today until this future, I think, and maybe the, I mean in terms of urbanism that, that I would um, promote, it's one where if it's possible to find space for these enormous blocks that you've done, that you, you demonstrate how it's really working with as much of what's there as possible because I, I, I think there's generally quite a lot of criticism around these very, very large development schemes that did require a lot of erasure in previous decades. That, uh, unless you want to say, actually, you know, it's terrible and I'm going to knock it all down and here's why. And then, you know, that's also valid but very difficult to sell. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I, well, I really enjoyed it, and, and particularly the drawings. Uh, and I used to live on the north side of the canal, staring at this building all the time. Well, yeah, couldn't really not. Um, can you go back to your colourful um, three dimension? There, this one. I think what's is for me. I, well, the drawing itself is, is, uh, is for certain extent, an, an, an illusion. Um, yeah, it, it's, it's, it's exploiting um, this kind of um, disjunction in the city because you've got the, the Westway, the railway lines, and the canal. So it is almost an island, isn't it? But for the West Edge, which I think is Goldhawk Road, road um, it is pretty much an island. And so it sort of justifies this otherness. Um, but you seem to, I mean, you, you seem to create, take great delight in Goldfinger's building, but as a kind of, um, you know, uh, pastel, you know, this sort of pastel colour rendering of it somehow uh, subverts its, you know, almost, you know, people have written about it as if the iconography of kind of battleships and, um, and war and, and, and the sort of dark, cuts in the concrete and the texture of the concrete as being both recalling the, the structures of, of the Atlantic wall but also recalling the structures of you know, warships and, and then sort of you know, destruction. So this is a completely <laughs> fresh reading of it and in a way because you know, this kind of version of urbanism is, uh, is it's, it's an island and also the way you you know, most of your experience of this will be aerial, so you're disassociated from the ground, and mm -hmm. and so you know these are questions of, in a way, I'm going to use the word success. You know, it's like we keep revisiting the question of what makes a successful bit of city and what makes a successful place to live and what makes a successful community, um, and and I guess you know like all forms of architecture, it's a projection 
of an idea, uh, you know, there's an ambition, uh, and even the choice of colours is a kind of manipulation of our, you know, you, you're, it's a, you're convincing us or seeking to convince, of, convince us of a kind of a, another world. But I do, I do, you know, I suppose, I, I wonder to what extent you are going to um, generate a problem of alienation um, as opposed to a, a community. And it, but it's interesting because there's a, there's a domestic scene where you've got um, plants and people juxtaposed to big bits of structure, you know, big sort of diagonal elements. And in a sense, uh, you know, that, that kind of um, scale of construction, you know, uh, in, in a way, uh, well, that could, uh, you know, that could um, dehumanize the domestic realm, or in that instance, in that drawing, somehow seem to completely make that plausible. But I suppose it's, it's the extent to which you make a series of scenes and the extent to which you make a totality. Uh, and I guess that's my, my question, is how these scenes build up to make something which is continuous, and if not continuous, how you kind of bridge those, because the ground might work, so to speak, mm -hmm. and other planes might work, but it's, it's how those planes relate to each other, which is both spatial, but it's also uh, sort of social, you know, as in, you know, who do you talk to and do you live here and those kind of things. Mm -hmm. So, uh, fascinating. Thank you. Thank you, Simon. I also used to live just across the canal for about a year when I just uh, came to London. And I was asking myself the kind of opposite question from the one that David just raised. How come this site is not, isn't on our radar? Something that is so attractive for development, if I may use uh, very commercial terms, and so kind of lost between the different um, streets and roads and the canal. So I think the question of positive disruption or healthy disruption or is any change a disruption or can we kind of calibrate disruption in a way that it becomes positive from day one? And I think Irene is finally willing to comment. Um, I think it was interesting that Pierre described uh, the Trellick Tower and Goldfinger's world as a closed world. And in a way, I think I agree with this. And it's interesting that your scheme took Goldfinger's Tower as your starting point. So in other words, how to try to up and it up. And Goldfinger and perhaps a Luftwaffe, you know, the bombing before, so where, where, you know, a tabula rasa on what existed in London. And I think it would be interesting for you to actually say something about this and say what you think about it. Because looking at your drawing in relation to the site, which I know a little, it feels like one tabula rasa follows from the one before, at least to some degree. And I not, and that's a question to you about what you think about this, because there are many countries in the world where a tabula rasa is not thrown upon in the way that it is in England and in Europe, and where a development on such a scope would appear to be justified. Mm -hmm. And if, you know, there may, there may be an argument there, either for or against, and, but maybe that's one for you to respond. Yeah, thank you. Um, um, would you like to respond, Sharon? Or? Um, it's just a lot to think about. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, unless Dominic or Larry or Elena would like to comment, we can move to the next presenter. Yeah. Um, before you do, I'll introduce Christos. Of course. Johan, thank mm -hmm. you very much. Thank you. So we, I, I promised earlier that we would be joined by 
my friend Christos Passas. Christos, I'm, I'm delighted you could escape uh, and, and come join us. Um, the, what I love about uh, Christos um, is that over the last 20 years of interacting with Christos, who's now director at Zaha Hadid, uh, the one thing I know I can count on is that he has the friendliest way of destroying uh, any idea I might put forward. Uh, and, um, and so I, I always love uh, having these, uh, these conversations with Christos because he reminds me always that there is uh, always a healthy debate to have going forward. Uh, so the, I'm delighted that you could join in with us, uh, Christos, and uh, we, we love having your experience here with us. Thanks very much. Okay, we are about to leave London for the next half an hour, and we are going to visit one of the largest container ports in the UK. Ishani, please welcome Ishani for the next project. Hello everyone. Today I want to share some ways that educational and research facilities could shape and transform not just our cities, but our rural environments too, and an inquiry into the regional system of railways. So, starting with Cedric Price, as his proposal for Pottery's Think Bell thought of learning, to be a driver of change for a derelict area. Here, interestingly, education is not a secluded facility, but is very much a part of a larger system of railways and major transfer points of goods and people. For example, in the corner left image um, shows the faculty and learning areas that are part of railways and housing. The railways have always been um, part of major transformations whether it is Hackney uh, or the stations that are part of high-speed uh, rail line. As the railway capacity in terms of its speed increases, the world shrinks even more, meaning that potentially a lot of areas which were outside the central city are even better connected. Cedric Price proposed a closed triangle through which people and goods could transfer through its three points that's shown in the first image. Although in this uh, day, speed helps to generate capacity. As we can do that, we can take trucks off the roads and take advantage of the regional system of railways. With the railway capacity and the intense network, the closed loop of Cedric Price now begins to work as a networked system. This system creates links that could connect different things like manufacturing centers, uh, of the Midlands in the UK to major export or import points along the network. So the railway network um, runs through different environments of work, production, exchange points, and conditions that have ecological characters with some railway stations involved. The grey patches on the right image uh, indicate this diagrammatically, the conditions. So potentially two conditions are selected. One is the port, while other is the wetland, through which railways move. As education and railways, uh, both could effectively transform these monotonous conditions. We imagined learning and research environments where if we want to learn about ports and logistics or even a wetland, we just learn right next to it rather than here in Bloomsbury or in like central London. Of course, these conditions are just possibilities. So, the first condition is Harwich. Harwich is significant as it is one of the largest container ports in the UK, which transfers goods from Midlands to international waters and is a major import-export point on the eastern part of England. In these times, we ought to learn about ports, as with certain systems like automation, sorting, repackaging, it creates opportunities for more advancements. And it's a competitive, um, it's a competitive field. These environments need new learning and research environments for more development. The exemplar of advanced manufactured, manufacturing building in Nottingham similarly creates an opportunity where one single facility has manufacturing units, workshops, offices, learning environments, and is a composite building with different capacities. 
So, a similar motive is taken here, where we create learning environments along with research, sorting, assembling, and distribution. Here, there is a very evident layering of existing uses from the river, port, railways, and it it's continues on the either side, where there's, a, there's an environment of warehouse and industries. So the way type responds here uh, is also in layers, where the continuity of long lean block is taken into advantage to stitch these layers together. So the first layer here becomes the center for logistics. Here, the sorting facilities are given on the port itself uh, to save time for deliveries. Uh, uh, these sorting facilities have a scale which is implemented even in the Amazon uh, sorting and distribution facility which is on the left. Here the scale is also responsive of the movement pattern where goods are received at a larger facility and they get broken down and sent to sorting facilities. Uh, which are labeled as small and medium, and the distribution facility, which is a relatively larger facility on the right-hand side. So now, the previous diagram gets converted into a central point where goods are received, whereas they, they go to sorting uh, facility and the distribution facility on the left-hand side and the right-hand side. Here, the type also comes forward as long lean blocks, which potentially overlook the operations happening on the ground floor level. And there are some galleries which could even view the operations that are happening on the ground level, while the cells in the plan are offices and meeting spaces for uh, the employees and the workers. Again, the scale is important here. The sorting facility which deals with smaller materials are um, the images that are shown in the bottom, whereas the larger facilities are shown on the top, like the container ports and um, the things that are being distributed in large boxes. The sorting facility here, um, this section shows the sorting facility of a uh, which is uh, of smaller materials, so a less floor space area is given, whereas uh, the workers increase as they need more staff to assemble and repackage everything, and the manual labor is increased. Um, so the offices and learning galleries surround the central atrium. Coming on the either side of port, here um, the facility is more about office environments and learning environments. So the long lean block is not just linear, but it takes the form of wings, just like the Wanke Center. The wings turn and create different enclosures, as both wings have different departments. The one has office, while the other side has uh, learning environments. So here, potentially, both uh, enclosures create environments, right? One is more of an uh, enclosed courtyard, which is team-based environments, whereas the other, uh, and it, uh, and it looks over the basement facility, which is kind of a sorting facility, again, which is connected from the port to the either side. And, uh, while, and the other image shows um, the enclosure which opens up to the landscape and the dome-like structures. Um, and the dome-like structures are the lecture spaces and the ground could be freed for the, uh, for the learners. Um, and the section on the top um, creates cellular formations of co-learning areas, meeting rooms, and even creates some kind of double, triple height volumes just to create a kind of community. Again, looking at the wings, some part of it creates open plans shown in blue, whereas other parts become cellular offices, and the angles of wings again create two different environments suited for ingredients like team-based environments and learning spaces, which could eventually bleed into the landscape. So the, this condition deals with learning and research to be connected with the monotonous environments of a port facility and potentially transforming and giving an imagery where community of learners and researchers could coexist. Now, coming to the second condition. Here we deal with wetlands. Wetlands are a part of an existing system of ecology. They are important and have ecological features of flora, fauna, 
and which should be explored. People could, should go see, learn from it, and it should also be protected and conserved. The wetland conservation deals with monitoring and testing of the ground conditions. So what if there was a facility where scientists, learners, and even visitors come together and create value in the condition? This creates an opportunity to collectively learn and research. Taking example of the A Hook Park, for, ex for instance. This is a facility where specific environment, um, the, it's a specific environment where people could go and learn from. In theory, Hook Park could also be a resource available not only to A, but also to many other universities and workshop centers. So why, can, why can't we imagine a conceivable facility in wetlands too, where collectively people from different communities come and learn? Although the process to build directly into a wetland is, is very tedious, what, is, what if we just build on the landscapes that are on the edge of wetland rather than into them? Here the long lean block with certain alterations is adopted as the form could be continuous and could benefit from the edge given to it so that the stakeholders could observe from it con continuously and it could have the same functions that, uh, that a facility in, embedded in a wetland could have while the closeness with the railway line creates good connectivity with the other parts. The long lean block creates cellular and open plan moments, which turn into laboratories, meeting rooms, that could even observe the wetlands, whereas the breakout spaces in the plan become spaces where the visitors could come, view, and observe wetlands from the galleries. Also, there is a point in the design when the type is lifted above the ground with a light touch as a measure to deal with flooding. The materiality of lightweight columns, porous slabs, glass, also helps in creating an imagery of a light touch in these precarious conditions. Also, the learning, research, and leisure environments are explored by laboratories, meeting rooms, lecture halls, and also the conservatories. So, a wetland which was one unoccupied and non-observable can now be appreciated with this light touch center, which brings the stakeholders together and creates stewardship and a community which is in charge of monitoring these wetlands. Also, this comes across as a visitor center, which, pro which people could go see the migratory birds and appreciate the flora. Overall, the idea that started with Cedric Price's provocation that education and research is equally important and could transform a monotonous condition now becomes, a, now becomes places where people could go, work, learn, observe. A train view here shows the diversity between the two conditions, where one deals with major logistics center while the other deals with creating stewardship in a neglected condition like wetland. And lastly, these conditions are just possibilities. They could change, expand, when the network is encountered with other conditions. Thank you. So, Christos, we are hoping for your sweet way to destroy, or what was the, the way in which would you like to start? I also have a lot of, to think about now. <laughs> um, thank you very much, first of all, and thank you for the invitation, Larry. Um, yeah, I, I think um, um, I think it's interesting to start thinking these sort of logistic spaces as spaces of otherness, yeah. uh, whatever that otherness may be. The question for me, um, as it's arising out of your presentation and as I try to gather my, my thoughts here for your particular project is, how do you choose which are the functions that should be uh, correlated with an existing condition? Why education and research and not gaming and bingo, for example? Mm -hmm. um, why not uh, light manufacturing or entertainment um, and uh, I would like to hear your answer about yeah. this in particular but also um, do you think that in trying to determine this perhaps trying to to preempt 
some of your answer, that there is a sort of sense of time programming here uh, that needs to be thought through mm -hmm. and not only as a sort of a binary relationship between what exists versus what comes new, but also as a more multifaceted enrichment of these particular sites. So a question, I don't know what the answer may be. But so uh, should I answer it? Yeah, so uh, why research? It's the ports are being advanced, right? It's the repackaging, assembling, everything. It needs a kind of um, continuous IT research and also the kind of, um, I think, um, the reassembling especially, it's very fascinating because it has algorithms. It has um, like people literally working in those things. And when it's like research is involved in that, uh, then I think it becomes more enriched. And when it's especially in one facility, then researchers can just come and visit the center and they could just be like, no, this should be assembled like this or something could be, you know, um, permutation and combinations could be done between things and there are like quick solutions for it. And for port being such a competitive industry, if there is a kind of research which is always backed up in it, I think it's always better to, um, to advance it. And I think many of the architecture firms also do that, right? They have a thing about research, and it really backs your project sometimes. I don't know, I mean, but um, yeah, that's, that's kind of it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, there are several things I really appreciated in your scheme. Um, and I think it's in part that the the building proposals um, very much inflect to their situation. And there was quite a credible sense of the spaces between your proposal and what was there, and between the parts of your proposal. And it's, it seemed that even in that formal way, your project um, Implicit, implicitly critiques a lot of the kind of development that one finds in these areas where there's, there is zero architectural uh, consideration between the built and the unbuilt. Mm -hmm. You know, a kind of shed world is, is probably defined by its kind of lack of concern for edges. And then throughout, throughout your scheme, there's a sense of um, you know, it's, it's more Venice than it is um, Tilbury. And I think that's interesting, just, just a level of form, even if, you know, I think it was an interesting question about program. And I suppose I wonder whether the, you know, the Cedric Price um, interest maps on to this, um, quite inflected architecture in that there's an en ennobling of the site through program, through um, the way buildings inflect, that, 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 that there's kind of high, high culture, high form for places that are used to, to being given low form and, you know, mostly distribution centers, etc. And the other thing I thought was interesting in the context of the previous two presentations is that you were much more comfortable with overlaying references to other people's work or to precedent with your own work and that the project kind of emerges between between things so there's a certain you know the story is between the content and I think there's there's something uh, that's interesting for me to see in, in the context of the day to, the afternoon so far in that it I think it gives you a lot of latitude to, to read your work as between precedent and site, between um, other voices. And, it, and it, it, I suppose it makes one realize that the, whenever you draw something entirely yourself, there's a politics to that that's already, you know, something to contend with. So anyway, thank you. Yeah, I, I enjoyed the presentation too, and a very sort of unloved 
context, and I, I understood that the, the program was that almost uh, you're, you're kind of learning above the shop, if you like, and that um, certainly in the, in the port situation, it's entirely vocational, and you have that symbiosis between what's happening on the ground or at track level mm -hmm. um, or at crane level, uh, and, and, working, and working and learning um, side by side with that, which I found really interesting. I don't know if you could over overlay that with uh, housing or not, or there's something more kind of, you know, furtive to explore there, more extreme, maybe. What I didn't get, though, I, I kind of got that. What I didn't get was the, um, was particularly the, the context of the wetlands mm -hmm. and what was specific about that um, learning environment. And maybe you, maybe you could answer that now. Yeah, um, you are asking me why I chose that. I, I'm asking you what, what the learning environment was and did it have a specificity to what was happening at the port? Oh, okay. Or was it a, was it, so, a, was it a higher education? Was it a school? I didn't quite get the, maybe I missed it. Maybe others got that. I thought it was No, the, even, yeah. I think it's, it's quite, um, it's kind of learning about them. And um, I think um, the learning and the research about the laboratory and, and stuff, it's just, I think, coordinated in a way, um, or it's just overlapping in some way, in my mind. And the research was about conservation and what, what kinds okay. of conservation uh -huh. techniques are there, and like ground level work and, you know, uh, planting and just conserving the wetland in some way, uh, conserving the flora and the learning environment was encouraged so that they could face it and then they could learn from the people who are actually so operating. So I would say if there was a vocational thread between the wetlands context and the port context, that would be really interesting as opposed to having two sort of kind of completely separate mm -hmm. pedagogies that don't really relate. They're connected by a, by a line, by an infrastructural line, but they're completely different contexts that would en enrich the, uh, the proposal for me. You know, so it's integrated, really. Well, thank you anyway. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. I think I have a question following roughly similar lines, and I think I can't quite decide if I'm looking at a contemporary version of Cedric Price, that you have a linear organization which can be filled with different programs, or do we look at something which builds clusters that then begin to have some synergies between those? You know, and I, I think it probably could be a bit of both, although I do find the cluster idea stronger, and I think the image I like most personally is when you had an axiomatic perspective where you spoke about neighborhoods, and you had a linear element, and they looked either in a productive courtyard and the other one it was something else, I can't quite remember. So I thought this idea that you bring a linear organization to a sort of, you know, to, to this plinth, and then it, it multiplies, I thought it was quite strong. Where I was less clear again, if you could you just go to your urban slide, to the very first one, we have the two configurations, port and the overview. This? Yes, for example, yeah. So, a lot of really interesting ideas, but I, I wasn't quite sure, do we look at the unit that could be repeated endlessly? Mm -hmm. You know, so I think, Again, maybe it's the question again of the catalog. You know, I, I think yeah. I understand your reasoning. I think it makes a lot of sense looking at logistics. I really like the idea of multiplying and bringing it together. Absolutely, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. But you know, I look at this as one side plan. I think be more interested. How often can you repeat this? Does it yeah. always have to be linked, or can you at which point can you begin to separate it? Mm -hmm. You know, so I think these questions would be really interesting to maybe explore a little bit, even if they're more more abstract, rather than this particular solution, this particular angle. Yeah. I think I was most interested when you argued at that scale it forms a certain coherence and it still continues. It has the bigger form. Yeah. To me, that was the most interesting point I thought. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I, hopefully I can try and add something. I mean, I, I enjoy what you're talking about, and I, I like the, um, the title you've given it, Transfer Inquiry into Regional Systems. I, I, I just wonder whether there's a potential to zoom out um, and, yeah. and talk about how this model, or this, this example, um, is, you know, reinterpreted in different locations mm -hmm. and I, I just thought you know one 
thought because you're placing it, you know, on the edge of the land, you know, you've talked about the container port. I mean, this, this idea of the model of education, in this kind of, I always thought about Cedric Price's Pottery Think World as a kind of, you know, mobile, slow burn kind of education, you know, that, that you know, you're, you're drifting through, through the country. Mm -hmm. effectively and, and it doesn't kind of separate it makes lots of connections and the potential for something like your project to to extend across the sea you know <laughs> the, the container port has has that potential and then you know I, I still can't quite get the wetlands connection but I, I mean I am I'm interested in that but just again you know because it's on the edge um, of the, the, the water body, I mean, the, the potential for that to become an international kind of research opportunity. I was just, you know, flying a kite there. The, the other point, I suppose, for me is that because it's a very grounded project, it makes me think, and it's a big, indeterminate, kind of large scale shed type building, that um, the other price obviously um, of a price project is, is the fun palace and the, the model of a fun palace as a kind of infinitely programmable large yeah. volume that is cultural and takes on all sorts of other trappings that you know maybe that's a conversation you know that, that you could expand into mm -hmm. if there's time just it, it, I, I just find it's very yeah. promising and it could go further I know it's not usually my role to speak in these uh, moments, but, but actually I wanted to thank Ishani for taking on a project that shows a kind of intrepid character. So, Ali, uh, you know, in, uh, in keeping with your previous advice that we get out of London and, and think about things differently, um, this is a project that is very different from the kinds of things we feel we know inside housing and urbanism. And in a way, Cedric Price was used as a kind of provocation to think very differently than we normally do. And Ishani was willing to take that on. Now, nevertheless, there are starting points. Mm -hmm. um, the, the turn towards high-speed rail and the increase in capacity that we gain from high-speed rail and the way in which that might lead us to rethink a more regional systemic planning uh, was in some ways the starting point. Now, of course, those regional systems mean that we have very, very different territorial conditions. And what Ishani was trying to do was to imagine how we could take two things at kind of wild extremes um, from an almost uninhabited wetland to a, a super intensive port and ask, can we have a consistent point of view about things that appear along the rail line? Now, it, in the space of a few short months, uh, I think it's an almost impossible challenge. And I think you did extremely well to keep some kind of control over this. N nevertheless, I think what we learn is that if we're going to handle a project like this with the same kind of uh, comfort and confidence, we're, we're actually going to have to spend time sort of digging into the way in which ports work and logistical systems work. Now, and, and Christos, uh, I know, is, you know, be, partly because of the nature of Zaha Hadid's practice, they, they end up being able to confront extremely bold visions that other countries have where Britain often tends not to. And, uh, you know, so I know that some of the things that Christos has had to think about are, what do we do about Industry 4.0 if we're going to replan ports, replan manufacturing systems? And, and this is what we will have to do if we're going to get into these other domains of thought. Uh, so, Ishana, you, in a way, have been willing to be a, a scout, as it were, um, and sort of begin to map out what 
you know, what we're going to be confronting if we take on this, this wider set of ambitions. But uh, just linking this back to history of planning, when I was learning planning at, at UCLA, uh, I was taught by John Friedman, who was, had originally been connected to the Tennessee Valley Authority, which was one of the early large, ambitious, cross-state regional systems uh, that, that influenced large-scale planning very much in the United States and was a cornerstone of, of Friedman's uh, formation as a planning thinker. And I, I think we, we will need to revisit some of, those, uh, some of those more territorial interests. And I know Elena Pascolo behind me has been part of helping us start to think about where some of that thought has been. So mm -hmm. hopefully we'll be carrying that forward. Yeah. yeah. Any comments from the audience? No, Irene, not this time. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you very much, Ishan. So London is calling again, and we are going back to see our final two projects in London, and I want to invite Dilara to take us to Brentford. Hello. Um, so in the last two decades, we have been witnessing a rise in large-scale residential developments in the UK. Looking at a range of projects that have been or plan to be built, four key urban conditions seem to make some sites immediately more attractive than others to mainstream real estate developers. Waterfront, Brownfield, High Street, and Growth Zone. If a site manifests even a single one of these conditions, we can safely predict that it will be developed by a scheme that has possibly been in the making for years. Despite taking place in a variety of neighborhoods with different qualities, the majority of these developments yield similar urban forms and establish the foundations of similar patterns of living. Some of the common strategies are the privatization of the waterfront, the reconstruction of the high street, the demolition of messy brownfield forms and the renovation of prettier ones, and the strengthening of peripheral economic activity through infrastructure. These common strategies are based on singular and even mythical readings of attractive urban conditions. By changing the primary motivation of development from speculation to care, we can find a chance to reinterpret attractive urban conditions and seriously explore the civic motivations that new development strategies and urban forms can engender. Care is a particularly strong driver of change at the moment because firstly, it's a theme around which uh, various public and private partnerships can be activated. Secondly, various stakeholders and decision makers across various scales are restructuring themselves around it. And thirdly, it has a particularly spatial and urban dimension. An area that's home to multiple sites marked by all are some of these urban conditions is Brentford. Located in West London borough of Hounslow, Brentford lies at the confluence of the River Brent and the Thames, is an inner periphery opportunity zone extending to Heathrow Airport, and has formerly been home to the Brentford Dock, a major transshipment point. Due to these qualities, the area has been subject to continual development pressure since 1995, when it was officially recognized as a regeneration area for the first time. The development pattern in the area is marked by introverted residential patches, which range from suburban cul-de-sacs to high security gated complexes. The site of study is situated near the western edge of the high street and the Brentford Dock housing estate, where the river Brent takes a northwestern direction. The one and a half hectare site is currently being developed by the Ballymore Group with an extensive five hectare scheme called the Brentford Project the key promise of which is to reconnect the high street with the waterfront. In generating care-oriented approach, care approaches to the development of attractive sites, the concept of agglomeration that we come across to often as a morphological outcome uh, should be requalified as a considered strategy. One way to do this is through the assemblage of a collective form. To find ways into assemblage, we can have a look at the existing relationship between different conditions. 
If we trace the interaction of the high street, waterfront, and brownfield sites, we see that there is a pattern of narrow public pathways that are often disrupted by large waterfront developments. However, there are also moments when the irregular forms of obsolete industrial buildings guide the dissolution of the high street to the waterfront. An irregular pattern, variety in size, and the consequential character of the landscape in between seem to highlight the collective and territorial opportunities imbued in these moments. To generate such opportunities across the whole site, we can explore a design strategy in which the big, the small, and the landscape are assembled through a considered irregularity and become the building blocks of a contemporary care landscape. The collective character of the waterfront can be strengthened through three buildings grouped by their size, event, and orientation. Their bigness brings multiple stakeholders together under one roof. Their at once residential and institutional character generates crossovers between public and private, and their positioning along the waterfront enables an anticipatory space and strengthens the existing public infrastructure. One of these buildings is a hybrid between the shed-like form of an indoor aquatic environment and the courtyard form of a residential assisted care environment. The courtyard form is lifted up, allowing the aquatic environment to be exposed in a variety of ways as a public infrastructure characterizing the ground level. Structural and material variations are mi mainly guided by considerations of light. Changing rooms are dug underground. While a half Olympic sized swimming pool expressed by a linear volume and more perforated structural elements claims the space closest to the river to take advantage of the southern lights, um, Sorry. Thermal bath spa and sauna areas are broken down to smaller pieces enclosed by thick and structural walls. Similar to Zumthor's Thermavals, where while these areas are significantly darker due to being tucked away deep into the ground plan, their atmosphere is marked by various forms of diffuse light. Through such variations that mediate dark and light, a sensorially rich journey advocated as an important feature of a care landscape is facilitated throughout the pool environment. While the heavy structure of the smaller pools and the cores extend higher to demarcate the courtyards of the assisted living floor, it dissolves into a lighter timber construction to accommodate housing. This creates a varied elevation on all sides and makes the housing seem like it's floating over a thickened topography. The landscape gradually slopes towards the high street facing side of the pool environment, creating a covered buffer zone for public use. The cores are carried through to the roof level, where a public terrace wrapped by housing and a public restaurant is situated. The patio arrangement of the courtyard form both structurally supports the roof terrace and enables the light to pass through all the way to the ground level. The residential care environment of this building reinterprets the assisted living model by tackling two issues. The first issue is the temporality embedded in the nature of professional care work. Situated on two wings that wrap around the pool volume, care workers' residences follow a hybrid of a dorm and hotel-like framework, offering various residential options for the changing work frequencies of different care workers. Type A is for more per permanent care worker residents, catering for a more individualized lifestyle. Type B is for care workers who have to stay over only one or a few days a week, catering for a more temporary residence. And type C sits somewhere in between. The second issue is providing different types of assistance under one roof for an intergenerational resident community. The courtyard typology is used to house people with varying assistance needs, as well as people who want to live with them through shared living models, such as home share. The serialized typology complements the legibility and simplicity of the circulation route across the floor. Two courtyards are created, which contain care rooms, a pathway, and two patios, providing daylight for the small pools on the ground floor. The care rooms are accessed through the interior corridors and are surrounded by the micro-landscaping of the courtyard. While some are multi-purpose, multi becoming a setting for a therapy session in the morning and a yoga session in the afternoon, some are designed for more specific medical functions. Alongside an assisted living model that operates in a serialized typology, we can also think of a shared living model, which follows a more complex and versatile typology in a smaller form. We see an example of this in Mezal Wohnen by Duplex Architects, 
where a simultaneity of smaller living areas and access to a bountiful, bountiful space of possibilities is achieved. The proposed building compensates reduced floor areas of flats by circulation areas, atriums, and hallways, reconceived as animated space of encounter into which the interior life of the flats can spill out or in which shared resources can be located. Organized around the core that is slightly shifted from the center of the building, an asymmetrical atrium sometimes gives way to spaces nested for more deliberate activities on occasions, such as co-working or table tennis. While advocating a notion of collectivity, this model is also interested in the provision of privacy. Assembled along a pinwheel structure are two types of flats which follow a split level arrangement, distinguished from one another through a slight difference in height. Their layout can be changed depending on different needs. This building deals with the high street as a site where community is performed and which is able to accommodate a rapid change of diverse services. To both free up and loosely organize the ground floor, the artifact uses a pinwheel structure with a structural core in the middle. A variety of volumes are generated through the aid of the heavy structure, which can be extended, perforated, or off offset by other structural elements. While structure is consistent throughout the building, through these maneuvers, the ground plane is able to accommodate a very different life from what's above it. While one side is level with the high street, gentle slopes and topographic interventions are used to weave commercial and care-oriented units to the landscape towards the waterfront. An irregular grouping of the small point block typo typology breaks apart the high street into a more permeable environment, reinforcing the mixed pattern that already exists in the area and allowing the development to become part of the city. Each building varies in height, internal organization, and public program, but they all share a higher ground floor for a variety of retail, office, and outpatient care clinics, and lower upper stories for shared living typologies. While the high street side is loosened up by the small and the changing, the waterfront becomes marked by the big, big and the fixed. Through such an assemblage of a collective form, a consistent dissolution of the high street to the waterfront is achieved, bringing with it new opportunities to influence the inner peripheral civic grounds. Thank you. Thank you very much. Who would like to start? Katharina, you're looking at me as you might be interested. No, no, I can Thank you very much. I really enjoyed that. I mean, I do tend to enjoy when it becomes really architectural, <laughs> I think it, you know, to, to be fair. But I think I really enjoyed the way you spoke about uh, the typological resolution of care in a building as an urban block. I think I really enjoyed that. So that was really good. It was great to see the variety uh, of solutions and really thought through. I mean, at the same time, of course, you could take the same configuration, you could do something else with it as well. Yeah. yeah. And I think it's worthwhile to recognize that when you move forward, no? Yeah. I think I also really like the logic of your urban, the, the logic of your urban diagram, and I think that's probably where we'd spend a little bit more time. Yeah. Um, <laughs> not because I don't think it wouldn't work, but I think, in, in, you know, because you focus so much on the, on the plan yeah. and the section, which is great. You know, but of course, in a way, it'd be really interesting to really think about the spaces between the buildings and the permeability, yeah. et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. You know, and I think there's a part of me who thinks, is it really the case that the largest thing needs to sit in the waterfront, yeah. or is it a question of articulation? I don't know, you mm -hmm. know, yeah. but maybe you don't know either. I mean, the principle of permeability, and I think the little sketch you showed with the view and the volumes at the very beginning, I really like that. Uh -huh. um, before, before, before. You know the one I mean, yeah, the, the hand sketch. This one? Yes, this one. Yeah. I mean, it was a very, very efficient little diagram, but very, very good in terms of communicating your issue and your problem, how you address that. Yeah. So, but I think it'd be good to look at the ground plan and plan and section of the urban scale yeah. that you can carry on consistently with your logic of care yeah. or whatever it is of types. Yeah, completely and agree. And, and complete that. I think that'd be my, my recommendation. But I really enjoyed that. Thanks. Thanks, um, Katharina. Thank you very much. I, I really enjoyed that as well. Also, um, I, I know this area quite well. I okay. used to live around here, um, and I've watched it being transformed. You know, in, into a into a developer 
environment, a developer paradise, you know, but, but you know, paradise for developer, but maybe not so, not so much for the people that used to live there, maybe still live there, have lived there for a long time, and, and, and you know, I, th I think a slightly truncated vision of what might happen in the future, so your approach the, um, is care-oriented. I think is is terrific, and um, I am. Um, I like the way you've played that out. I, I suppose I, I just it's a question, really. Do you you know? And it's a cliched question, but do you, but you know, do you see this in a way as an opportunity to resist um, the developer-led yeah. approach? Yeah. Um, I mean, I think um, a section that I wanted to look further into was how this assemblage could be an opportunity for bringing more diverse stakeholders and actors together by, so maybe the smaller buildings would be developed by some private developers, but maybe the big building would be developed by someone else. So I, it was, I didn't look at this in detail, but that was definitely a driver of the form, like how the form can be care oriented in the way that it also brings more people together, more um, actors together, yeah. I don't know if that's exactly what you were asking, no, that, but that's yeah. That's really good to hear. I just, a yeah. couple of other points just, I mean, I think I suggested with one or two of your, the other students that, you know, this idea of zooming out and you, you can make yeah. the kind of larger kind of conceptual story for this, this area and, yeah. and maybe a, a broader, you know, a broader kind of take on, yeah. on, 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 on how you might go forward. But, but in terms of, in, in fact, following back a uh, couple from what Katharina said about the, the building, I, I'd like to know more about this, you know, the spaces between yeah. and the kind of, it's slightly dry at the moment, your presentation. Yeah. And, and if there's a moment, you know, some time you could, yeah. I hope, you know, it would enrich and, and show how inhabitation might yeah. be. Yes. Yeah. yeah. That's the next, I'm looking forward to sitting down and making these beautiful like visuals and looking at the details, for, yeah. Well, <laughs> Thanks. Well, thank you, I mean, I, I commend this, this piece of work and um, I thought you explained it incredibly eloquently as well. I was completely convinced. I was so convinced that I, I wasn't sure when the precedence ended and your work started, because um, it, it was it was really incredibly assured work. And as I understand it, the, there's the big and the small. I was interested in where the medium is. Maybe that's the next your next your next move. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> uh, the idea of focusing on on water in therapeutically, but not just having that as a as a as a thing for the for the for the people who need the care but also people who need yeah. care who are working there as well. I thought that was beautiful. Um, and then in, in terms of the small, I, I, you weren't explicit about it, but I understood that to be more self-directed care. Uh, yeah. Sort of a nurture environment, wasn't it? The, the, the way there was more independence, which I thought, again, was balanced. There's overall a kind of modesty to the proposals as well, which I, I think could keep the developers at bay, maybe, and in that it could be affordable, and therefore, for me, is believable. Yeah. I'd agree with, with with Pierre about about the gaps in, in in the presentation and they look like sort of textbook drawings <laughs> in our commendation. Yeah. But the spaces in between and the extension of the building out into the landscape is, is a gap right yeah. now I think that yeah. can be filled and and once you've done that you've got a you've got a fantastic project I think. Mm, thanks. Yeah, well done. Yeah, I'd agree with a lot of the very positive feedback you've got. Um, going back to where you started in this question of um, speculation versus care. Yeah. Um, I and I think it's something to do with these diagrams, and then. Yeah. I mean, you set yourself quite, up quite well to now do perspectives. You know, um, the experience of someone in the space. I wonder whether it would be, be great to see you um, skewer the developer housing even more directly in order to demonstrate 
how far your model diverges mm -hmm. from what's already there. Because I think there is a, I mean, to go back to the point of, it, it's perhaps disappointing as a place to live for people that, and other than for the, the developer model of um, highly lettable units mm -hmm. um, for probably relatively transient um, occupants. And I think there's a type, which, which is a kind of bar building, where everything communal is pushed into the public realm. And I think just typologically, your buildings are quite different in that they have these um, degrees of shared space that make the transition from public to private much more graded mm -hmm. and sequential. And I think it's within that typological shift that it's, it's, a, it's a kind of very significant departure. Mm. It feels therefore quite European as a type and not very London because yes. by and large London is made by developers and they can't help but produce yeah. a very particular yeah. type. Yeah. And um, I think there's also therefore the connections to other types that are not very London like the Palazzo as a the sense of something that can be both solitaire and part of a terrace, but is fundamentally um, uh, has an inner world as well as a public face, and, and I think that's where it starts to become um, provocative at, at a city mm -hmm. scale. Mm -hmm. It's demonstrating the the absence of op op options yeah. typologically within some of these contexts. So. Yeah, super interesting, and and fantastic drawings. Thanks. Really, very convincing. Thanks. Hi, congratulations from me as well about your scheme. Thanks. Uh, I'm going to pick up where the last speaker spoke, and I would concentrate on three arguments that were made today in your presentation and the comments. Um, firstly. You know, you mentioned four conditions that are favorable for developers. Yeah. And you got me thinking there because as per the comments that one of you made before, the game of development is so tight in London <laughs> that you absolutely need one external factor to differentiate the product from everything else that's being made. And that's an incredibly difficult game that developers play and of course, you know, the whole product and production of architecture through them is very well aligned to, you know, loans and mortgages and interest rates and cheap materials and the rest of it. Mm. Which leads me to think that someone in your position should not only be concentrating perhaps on the old people's care home, it, understood correctly this is what it is or maybe I can so, I can so I can <laughs> maybe, maybe no, starting with people I can, I, can <laughs> I mean I'll just say that it's meant to revisit the assisted living through bringing different types of assistance together so it's not just elderly care it's okay yeah okay but that presupposes that there is an alternative system of social cohesion and interrelationships that needs to be put into play in order to assist those less able, yeah. you know, of, yeah. of all ages, let's say. And coming from a large Mediterranean family, <laughs> which is also suffering the onslaught of modern, postmodern uh, family explosion to different geographies and countries, where we nowadays, if I may, um, see the 25 people, family, together once every two or three years. Um, and rewinding the time backwards, I basically want to go to the point where the social fabric that traditionally used to tend to those less able is now, of course, disappearing. Not to labor on the point too much, but what I wanted to challenge you on fundamentally was if you're going ahead with this proposal, and it's a very good proposal, does it make sense to also start thinking about those three developer blocks that are right next to you and take some poetic license and start thinking 
what those residential blocks may become if this uh, care unit becomes the protagonist of this mm. particular neighborhood. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, and beginning to take much more impactful and wider actions mm -hmm. to create, at the very least, at least in an academic environment, a prototype for living that challenges the notions that we all live with today. Yeah. And in doing so, would it also perhaps give you an opportunity to challenge the um, Corbusian typology, um, whereby you begin to rethink the relationship of those units internally themselves? Mm -hmm. Because I think it does worth a closer examination, kind of a passionately and obsessively detailed examination of how the various relationships work mm -hmm. in these spaces. Yeah. And, um, you know, I'll give you a personal experience. When my grandma was in her 80s, suffering from Parkinson's, she went into an assistant healthcare unit, and I found it absolutely impossible to accept. And that brought a lot of discontent between me and the rest of my family. Unfortunately, other people were making these decisions higher in the familial higher than I was. And, uh, and uh, of course, it's always a compromise. But there is a point there where you can begin to, you know, work on the, on the proverb you started with, I care because you care, mm -hmm. you know. And, and I think you have to give it a full positivist approach and make this prototype potentially work in a way that begins to give us all tangible examples of how such situations could be um, managed and, and, and orchestrated in this yeah. case. Um, um, yeah, I completely agree. And I think outlining a physical prototype and action framework would be super helpful. I think theoretically I tried to do that through the way I frame care because it wasn't just about assisted living elderly, but it was more about like it can't, like urban form, like how every housing project is actually, a, should be a care project because um, every care is vital, it's relational, it's about the types of ways we communicate, we live with each other, so it was, uh, that's why I think I framed the second typology also as a care model because um, yeah that was the sort of yeah leap I was trying to make theoretically but I agree that it would be really useful to put it down on paper yeah very nice project thank Th you thanks yes Larry you have time actually yeah. <laughs> so it's all right now now I uh, now that we've started a trend um, <clears throat> look you know, some of what you've been asked is to be more anthropological in a way. But um, I just want to point out something else that I see in this that I think the, the comments have been running towards. And that is that perhaps uh, as much as anyone we've seen inside the program, you've attended to the question of, you know, how do we build something like this? And really looking at it from the point of view that um, the, the nature of the type and innovation in the type requires thinking about structure. And you spent quite a bit of time in dialogue with Dominic on that. Now what you were absolutely insistent upon was a kind of starting point about your notion of care and the variety of spaces that that involved. And yet you had to give that some kind of rigor in terms of exploring construction. Now, what that ended up producing, in my mind, was the idea that understanding construction matters to exactly the kind of question David was asking, which is, how do we begin to pull collective environments more effectively up into a building so that the building becomes a seed for a wider associational life? Now, I think that conversation uh, has been running back and forth across uh, all of the comments. Mm -hmm. And uh, I just want to say that from, from my point of view, this kind of sets 
another standard for the significance of thinking about construction and building typology in relation to these anthropological questions. And indeed, you didn't have enough time to complete all the stories, but I think there's something really very special about where you found balance in the conversation between the two. And I have to thank Dominic uh, for yeah, the <laughs> amount of time that he gave to helping you explore that. So that's yeah. really great. Thank you. Just also wanted to add, um, there are all these questions about you know drawings that are not presented here or drawings that would be great to have. So just to remind our jurors that what you are seeing is perhaps 10% of the work that is uh, forming the thesis, the, the publication. And I th I'm sure students will be happy to share with you, if you wish, uh, their complete piece of work because there is much more. And we are working hard with the students to help them to actually curate the final set of 20 slides, which gets quite frustrating at times because you have to make difficult choices when you are asked to present within 10 minutes and with 20 slides and there are unavoidably there are drawings that you regret not including <laughs> so it's uh, for those of you who will be interested the, to see the full piece i'm sure delara will be yeah. delighted to share yeah. thank you very much thank you Okay, so the final presenter for today, and thank you for bearing with us, and <laughs> it's not the easiest task, is Anna. And Anna is taking us to River Wandel, where we started the day, so southwest. So those of you who, who were with us in the morning would remember this interesting corridor. So we are going to finish the day in the same urban area. <clears throat> Hello everyone, uh, my name is Anna Spuntova and um, I would like to talk to you today about uh, careful neighbourhoods. When we look today at the way the traditional care environments are organised, we realise that very often they are purely thought of as machines for service delivery. They do not offer us opportunities for cultivating meaningful relationships across ages beyond highly engineered and institutionalized spaces, which means they are not accessible for families. And they're also not thought of as environments that can drive urban transformation and form long life neighborhoods. How do we change that? We could perhaps start by allowing different generations of one family to work and live in close proximity to each other, by allowing five kids from different families to spend time at the same nursery next door and then meet at the dinner at home that is shared by their families. By allowing elderly who need assistance in their everyday life to live next door to their grandchildren while not giving up on the services uh, of health and well-being while still remaining their independence. Let's start by looking at this place. Um, this is a circulation space of a corridor, uh, but it starts to be transformed by the residents into a meaningful collective space uh, through partial privatization. It is then immediately adjacent to spaces that are more ambiguous in terms of their sharing capacity. I would like to show how it starts working in a plan. And uh, the place that I was showing you is right here in the middle. This is the circulation gallery. Um, and it is then adjacent to uh, the living rooms that are shared by each by two individual units. Um, these living rooms allow the residents to host their guests and families, um, study and work beyond the space of their individual dwellings. Um, sorry. Uh, the individual units themselves shift from the traditional lectolinear form and start working with an L shape that allows us to firstly avoid entering directly at the bed, uh, which is so often the case in traditional care environments, and also uh, micromanage the privacy in the unit itself. The scheme is intended as a version of an assisted living environment, 
For those who in their later stages of their lives are wishing to downsize their households, but want to stay in close proximity to their friends and family, retaining lifestyle, lifestyle independence. Another scheme is designed with the life of potential key workers and their families in mind, when the culture of trust and collective raising of kids becomes important. The spaces that we traditionally put on the opposite sides of the need for privacy spectrum, like workspace and um, daycare, come right next to each other. Um, this gives the residents flexibility in organizing their daily routine between workplace, home and parenting responsibilities. The other side of the corridor belongs to the more private realm of the two-story dwellings. Here, cooking and dining experiences are those that are being shared by two households and their close ones. The kitchens are brought to the light wells of the circulation space. This way, the process of cooking and dining becomes part of the visual engagement with the surroundings and is given a supervisional quality in relation to the spaces of work and daycare across the hall. It allows us to establish a whole range of possible patterns of interaction between the residents and the visitors of the building. The, proje the project in question looks into how collectivity is formed around the notion of care. The basic diagram of a deep floor plate cluster suggests moving away from the traditional highly individualized care units that are pos positions next to the uh, much larger collectivized spaces. These schemes are actually part of a larger assemblage, which is located in a relatively fragmented environment, partially separated from its surroundings um, by a rail line over here. Um, it is also facing waterfront with allotment gardens and the park, which is then adjacent to the existing high street. The um, expanding from the logic of design investigations that I talked about before, we can start to think about designing for care not as just a problem of designing a single care venue, but rather of creating an ecology of care, a system that brings together all kinds of services and therapies uh, at our doorstep, when care becomes a strong driver for transformation of challenging neighborhoods in our cities. Uh, where could we potentially see such an ecology merging? Uh, let's have a look at the corridor that is formed along the River Wandle. Um, it's located in the southwest of London. Um, here's the north, this is the Thames, and the corridor starts connecting Wandsworth to Croydon in the south. Similar to several other corridors in London that come from an industrial past, it offers a certain conflict. Fabric disrupted by industrial heritage, large-scale transport armatures, and endless streets of London vernacular. Such an area is unthinkable today in the context of traditional care environments. However, it does offer us an amazing landscape, layers of educational and healthcare infrastructure, and is well connected to the central city. A new approach to care ecologies and lifelong neighborhoods can give us a key to start looking at this corridor in a much more systematic way. And I'm going to show how um, using one indicative site uh, located over here. Um, there are many areas along the River Wandle, I will call them enclaves, that share similar characteristics and are all, in a way, irregular. Within these irregular conditions, we can start to identify three distinctive conditions that in fact organize them. Those will be the high streets, light industrial zones, and areas of nature and allotments. Each of these conditions is important for our neighborhoods, but is often under-theorized today. Another quality that I think is important about these conditions is that the medium scale is missing from them. We can find the extra fine grain of the traditional residential and the extra large scale of the industrial elements, but the most trivial scale is not there. Accumulation of care environments oriented towards collectivity can fill in the gap at a mediating scale. In order to unlock the potential of the area, uh, the first step uh, would be to find a more systematic approach to the way its servicing is organized, so that the logistics stops being a disruptor to the area. In order to do that, we can free part of the industrial area behind the sheds between the railway in order to organize a dedicated logistics and servicing corridor 
with the um, separate shed for parking and turning of the trucks. The existing parcellation of, um, that is ex existing on the site can actually give us the uh, sense of dimensions and start to help locate the project as something that establishes balance and integration within a wider circulatory system. This way, the light industrial vocation of this area remains. But what we start to notice is that actually, perhaps it's, it's also a great place to live in. It starts to offer us characteristics of adult playgrounds. And we can imagine how in the close future they can become lifelong playgrounds. Um, just to kind of locate you, uh, we're not looking, the river is over here, we're looking from the side of the railway and the north is on the side. Adjacent to the Rithort industrial area come together two kinds of residential environments. Uh, they're linked, this is the first one and then the second one is over here. They're linked to each other uh, through a series of gardens, courtyards and allotment gardens. This is where we see how, determined by the existing parcels and dimensions, these elements can start transforming a fairly substantial part of the area. They can be juxtaposed to each other and successfully coexist without a need to be thoroughly interwoven. If we start looking at the whole system, imagining how all of the elements in the area start working together, an opportunity for a broader landscape emerges with a richer environment that is built around health and well-being, the one that creates a platform for stakeholders to start building multi-sectorial bottom-up governing systems. A landscape that includes opportunities for interaction with the water, doing sports in a group or individually, practicing gardening, organizing events, having a leisurely walk, or renting a place in a boat workshop. Um, Part of the existing uh, of this landscape is framed by an existing high street and a park behind it. In general, today, the traditional high street, so typical for London, is struggling to redefine its purpose, and bringing care environments to them becomes particularly challenging. Two new types are introduced by the project to rethink the high street in terms of the kind of daily rhythms it can take, and shift it from being nothing more than just a concentration of shops. A linear form over here shapes the edge of the park and starts to create distinctive environments on both of its sides, which are equally hardworking. In contrast to the high street um, approach to linearity, which suggests a rigid distinction between the front and the back of the house. It addresses the condition of the park on one side, which stops acting as a backyard of the terrace houses, and invites sports infrastructure and urban agriculture amenities. The other side is the one that is still open for the neighborhood, but starts offering more secluded, intimate spaces of gardens and playgrounds, creating a transition from the super private spaces of the residential backyards. Another archetype of care is introduced in a courtyard building. It's uh, over here. Opening up double lit spaces and a courtyard on the ground floor for civic oriented settings open both to the local community and the residents, it starts off an alternative to the traditional image of the ground floors that are shaping the high street. The idea of gardening at once private allotment is extended into a whole system that celebrates food and brings people around eating and producing. An additional layer infrastructure is brought next to the existing allotments, greenhouses, an orchard, and spaces for catering and event hosting. Industrial structures next door can then be used to cover the servicing needs of the urban agriculture production. The industrial land extended towards the river becomes a more civic-oriented surface, housing a rowing school, a boat workshop, and a new route along the Wendell. Perhaps by broadening the set of businesses that the industrial land can support and creating crossovers with the new care ecology, we can start retaining the viability of our employment lands. We can imagine how a shed becomes a setting for catering events, cooking workshops, or a restaurant that collaborates with the producers next door and takes advantage of the freshly grown local foods. The dimensional characteristics of these spaces become instrumental to other spaces in the project. 
The substantial height of the ceiling and large window surfaces on the ground floor become crucial to the quality of light and air and to the range of programs these spaces can accommodate. Coming back to the assemblage I was showing you in the very beginning, every deep floor plate cluster that comes in next to the industrial land can operate as a single building with its parts benefiting from the services offered by the others and the collective offer embedded into their architecture. However, um, each part is independent enough to be built separately and occupy land sequentially, not imposing master planning solutions on the industrial land. The system of clusters does not choose a primary orientation and works with a version of frontality that is closer to the way a campus organization operates on a landscape, with multiplicity of entrances and a network of secondary and primary path. Overall, the project has an aspiration to show how parts of what is currently the Wondell Corridor can be turned into a series of well-defined, highly performing, careful neighborhoods. Thank you. Thank you. So, who would like to go first? Christus, you started. Thank you very much for a very uh, exciting, inspiring presentation. Um, we have been seeing and discussing today how we can begin to, I guess, um, impact existing um, pieces of urbanism, but by transforming them into something else, something more desirable, something much more adapted to what we want to be living with and in today. And I think this is um, an interesting example of how perhaps um, with careful drilling down into the details of the matter, one can begin to re-engage in the typologies that make these spaces in, in the smaller scale, but then also in the, in the larger scale. And the way you took your presentation from the interior of the spaces to the outside is actually quite genius. I did uh, I was very impressed with the glazed interior spaces of the multi-tenant unit and the way that you can begin to see from one's room into another, into another, into another, into another, with interruptions of light, plants, bicycles in the way, and you know children's toys, etc. And I think it was really interesting to see that sort of environment, but. Now that I've seen it, I feel like I would like to feel how it is to live in it. Mm -hmm. and, and I think it's quite interesting and exciting to speculate on those instances. Unfortunately, um, the architecture of today, for better or worse, became a lot about the wall, about the way we build, not about the way we live and the way we, we operate and negotiate um, mm -hmm. spaces and boundaries and activities within within these spaces and at some point I started laughing inside me because I thought can you imagine one of those sort of compulsively obsessive old ladies who want complete privacy <laughs> and they lock everything up and they put carpets on the wall and whatever and what mayhem <laughs> would actually happen in there. Mm. But I think that's uh, that's life, huh? That's that's uh, they will you know. still have their um, privacy. They can still put carpets on the walls in their private units, but then kind of meet their grandchildren in the middle and still kind of you know. No, I agree. I agree. But the fact that you are, you're able to witness those sort of idiosyncrasies and, and enjoy life at its full majesty, I think, is what that architecture does, and and I think that's that's very very interesting, inspiring, and important. Thank so you. So thank you for that. Thank you. Yeah. Um, thanks for another great presentation. Um, yeah, I, I was also very taken by the, the model. And I was intrigued because I thought that the, there, was, there were two modes of representation that I found particularly communicated well. That was the, the hand diagrams mm -hmm. and the model. 
And then what I noticed was that when I tried to read the diagram in your plan, it was hard to see the things that were so clear in your diagram and model back in them. the plan. You could, I mean, I mean, so for example, the, uh, it was right at the beginning. Yeah. Um, so, okay, yeah, that, that model, mm. yeah? Go, go back to the model. Oh, uh, you mean the, the view or? The uh, view inside, yeah. yeah. Okay, the, I agree, there's a quality to this that was, in a way, it was, it's curious now, we've seen the whole presentation, because it was unique as a, as a moment in your presentation, being that three-dimensional, that experiential. And um, what was clear in here is the importance of the light well. And then if you go back to your diagram and your, okay, here. So okay. what I thought was fascinating, in, all, in all of your diagrams, it's clearer what the story of the project is. And then I thought it was particularly interesting, in your light wells, even the light well isn't marked with a cross or anything. They, they almost disappear. And I thought what was, what was interesting is with the clarity with which these things appear in some representations and how it feels like when you draw in certain ways, you're motivated by something else which is perhaps less intuitive and less conceptually clear. I, I think I can quickly okay. just to comment on that because um, and I think it's because in those diagrams m my main motivation was to convey the, the organization of the system, the spatial sequence because it becomes important, this gradation of privacy and you know the more uh, the units that are drawn with the single line that are in enclosed and then they kind of transition through and then the light wells here become part of these partially shared space and then here I wanted to show more how the floor pit is organized so but I wonder what, for me, why I, I, that makes sense but for me I the idea of your project which I think is in the scheme is realized in the scheme through the models and diagrams is the importance of your idea and if your drawings diminish that impact mm -hmm. then there's something not quite right about the drawing rather than you're trying to show something yeah. else yeah. because I think that you could draw the same plan and it would be much closer to your concept mm -hmm. um, than it is currently and the reason I think that's relevant is that a lot of your presentation had quite a kind of a particular projection yeah so at some point you chose to draw everything in uh, I don't know what the, it's kind of planimet planimetric, yeah. Mm. And again, I have the feeling <laughs> that the, the planimetric proje projection is, is causing you a lot of labor, and I'm not sure how much it's helping you with your scheme. Mm -hmm. And that there are aspects of the scheme that are either more interesting or are unresolved. And that the, the laborful you know, way of drawing is, is not helping your idea. Mm -hmm. So I would say that the idea is great, and in the, t <laughs> in the couple of weeks we used to have, I would almost try less to invest so much time in challenging drawings, and more in, you know, I'd like to see the site drawn with that level of clarity, so that I actually understand. Mm -hmm. Because one potential weakness in the scheme is that um, at an urban level, it was quite compound-like. It kept making me think of um, uh, military compounds in urban situations where there's a very, very strong boundary and then things tend to start by being aggregated around the edge and then the, and then the, the spaces in between are quite um, left over, used but left over. And yet sometimes urbanistically it had that, which maybe has the same feeling that the way you've drawn your courtyards it's almost like the idea just peters out. It's a great idea, it's in your scheme, but I look at the plan and I was like, I, I can't tell what's important mm -hmm. anymore. And I wonder whether it's the same with the urban thing. Draw, draw it in the ways that you really feel your project and not in ways in which you think that's a, you know, that's a particularly mm -hmm. accomplished way of, I mean, because they look incredibly, you know, time, I mean, they're very impressive, but I am looking thinking like, I want to know you know, with the same intrigue about the courtyard, like what, what's, what's important in the scheme. And I'm actually kind of spending quite a lot of time kind of trying to understand the drawing. Mm -hmm. Now that may be my, my uh, inadequate uh, ability to read 
Anometric drawings, but anyway, I, because you did these other two pieces of work, which again I think to repeat that the, the model is so fantastic. I, can you do that to everything? <laughs> <laughs> sure, no problem. <laughs> there you go. Thank you very much. I really enjoyed that presentation, uh, and I enjoyed all the drawings, particularly this one, which is why I've kept my glasses on. Um, I, I, I think um, just actually going back to this morning, I think Rashida, this was the this is the textures that are here evoking certain terrain. Uh, would be great to put in. If she's still in the room. <laughs> would be great to put into to your drawing, as as we as we as we mentioned. I think what's interesting about the project as well. It's a lot to take in. Actually, it's fast again. Um, is the is the scale with which you can engage with communal or the communal or, or the intimate? I thought that was really interesting. You've got that. You've got that range of opportunity. Uh, you're not forced into into a, a collective or communal situation here. I think. Which is, which is great to see. I think that was one of the points that was made in another scheme uh, this morning. So I'd commend it. Also, I love the, the David Colden, the, the model of, of, the, of the 3D drawings, which are kind of neutral, apart from the vegetables or the, or the toys. I thought that was a, a lovely t touch as well. So, and I think that's where the two drawings, one is with, with, from, the, from the sort of corridor space with the light wells, and the other one was from the communal kitchen which is where your interests were. I think you could do more of that maybe to explore the really super important bits. Uh, but I, I think it's, it's a delight. Thank you. Thank, thank you. I, yeah, I, I enjoyed the presentation and find it um, particularly rich. Um, I, I like the, the way you've taken on the Wondle Corridor um, the, the kind of questions I ask there are, you know, does it cross borough boundaries? And the, the notion of, it, it's almost like a, a, str a strategy for a UDP and, and almost you want to kind of go back and unravel what you've proposed as a, as a, in, as a series of more perhaps strategic scenarios. Yeah. And, you know, this is one. Or, Maybe this is it, you know. It's but but that 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 something maybe that available in the time for you to to do the the other um, aspect of the the project I want to talk on and, and and I think some of the comments that have been made are, are really supportive and and helpful. But I I was just wondering about um, in in this strategic overview you talk about. You may talk about the potential for phasing, the, the time frame for long-term and short-term initiatives, mm -hmm. um, which are available and, and could be, you know, you could read this in, 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 in many ways that, that could reflect those kind of observations. And, and, and then, apart from the long time frame, I, I was even wondering, because you have, I think that the, 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 the models of inhabitation, I, I find very intriguing. I'd, I'd like to spend more time them and just try and discover how you've, you know, the, the, the opportunities that they offer, you know, for mm -hmm. individual family collective living. Um, I just wondered about the speculation about the daily cycle, you know, something about the nocturnal maybe um, that, that might be interesting to think about, you know, what, what's this whole territory like mm -hmm. at night? Um, okay. and, and you know how do you access it? You know, it, it's it's sort of again, the, the the drawing doesn't necessarily demonstrate how you know the motor vehicle is accommodated. Um, the, but the, and and the last point I'd, I, I'd I'd like to make is really about this conversation about ecology, care ecology, and I just think you could be a little bit more explicit. In, in, in coming, you know, in, 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 con, you know, in your conclusion about what, what you've achieved and what you, what, you know, what you hope to achieve and what, what you think you might achieve and how this might evolve, you know, as, you know, over mm -hmm. time. But really, really interesting entry. Thank you. Not that much for me to add. Uh, <laughs> I really loved it. I thought it was fantastic. I really liked the way you start with the corridor then to the building, to an assembly of buildings, to a cluster, to a um, proposal, which I think is very convincing. I think that worked for me really, really well. 
I didn't mind the rendering, David. <laughs> Don't so a contradiction, but that's okay. But I really also enjoyed the diagrams with the plan uh, uh, to understand them, and I thought of how powerful it was to inverse the hierarchy between living bedrooms. You know how rarely you see that. You know, and I think, of course, it makes perfect sense if you look up by the situation of space. So I thought it was. You know, really interesting also for me to reflect upon, you know, the way you've drawn it up, so I really enjoyed that. Uh, only minor comment, if you have a bit more time, I think it'd be worthwhile to look at the intersection of the build volumes and the ground plane on the, for the urban scale, and I think yeah. even if you just look at some precedents, I mean, all the good housing, uh, co-housing projects I know in Berlin, they're all very intelligent, the way in which they articulate the ground level. It's not never just a flexible space. Yeah, yeah it's almost always a, a sectional articulation that links the shared space inside the co-housing project to the urban realm. And so often the way they, it works in sections is quite complex. So you could just show a couple of those because in a way they very yeah. often then act as programmatic catalysts for the wider um, area as well as bringing other stakeholders. And I think a really easy way to add one more layer the way in which you can begin to orchestrate your urban strategy in a very simple way. That sounds yes. great. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Katharina. Again, as I was saying previously, many of the drawings you guys are mentioning exist, and you will have a chance to see them in the booklet sections that uh, Anna had to edit out. So we are doing really great time-wise. At Solari, do you want to carry the tradition of summarizing the presentation? Sure. You have at least sure. 10 minutes. Yeah. So. Well, I, I just wanted to actually follow up, uh, Anna, in um, commending your project. And uh, really, when I think about um, as I think Christos was pointing out, your, your bravery in accepting the idea of starting from the inside and working out. It, it's one of the things that we believe in as a program, that we need to understand better the intimate life of buildings, and that urbanism follows in many ways from that, if it's well understood. And I think trying to, you know, there's a tendency for urbanism to always start with the grand scale and then imagine that finally we get around to the building and it's in some sense a, a response or a solution to a preconceived notion of how we should read the grand scale. What we're trying to do is to find that balance, but perhaps by often shifting towards prioritizing the interior. And I think you showed that remarkably well. And I know that wasn't your initial inclination. Uh, and so again, you know, there's a, a personal bravery that you showed in being able to make that uh, shift. So I, I appreciate that hugely. Um, I, I just actually want to, to follow on a little bit and, and thank uh, our jurors because it's been a very long day and uh, particularly for Lee and Katarina who've been here from the, from the morning, you've had to uh, maintain a level of attention to all of this for a long period of time and what I notice is that you uh, you were able to grasp what was distinctive in in each of the projects in a way that is very constructive for us. Uh, so I appreciate that hugely. And then to add in David's and Christmas's comments at the end as fresh voices is is a, a real pleasure for us. Now, um, most of all, uh, I would like to thank the students themselves. Um, I know how hard you have worked to meet the, the deadlines, and um, I, I think the work speaks for itself today. You've done beautifully, and your commitment and contribution is noted, because these are the kinds of projects that should be influencing where the field is thinking. And I think that showed up very much in the conversations we were able to have at the end of the day. Uh, the the I think one of the things that George and I have always been interested in uh, is in showing an urbanism that is 
very close to the present day. We're, we're looking for an urbanism that can think provocatively, but very much in keeping with current conditions of development, and to try to imagine how the, the, the drivers of change that we see around us, that we can observe, we can feel, can be pulled into the projects. And I felt that across the day, uh, your work showed that very clearly. Uh, I think that the, there's one other thing that was picked up on over the last couple of presentations, and that is there is a strong belief within the program in an associational logic uh, to the way in which cities work. Now, if we take a, uh, um, a number of recent London developments, if I, we can pick any number of them, but let's say Elephant Park down in, in uh, Elephant and Castle, we can see very clearly the emphasis upon public realm and engagement between ground floor and a new park. That is all very obvious, but as soon as we go up into the building, we lose any sense of that associational life. Now, what we've all been looking at here, and all of you picked up independently without me mentioning it, is the idea that by starting with the interior life of the buildings uh, and exploring that as an associational realm, uh, we can begin to influence the way in which cities are understood as a political and associational environment. So that's some of the things that are most important to us and that uh, urban areas transform through changing practices that can be supported by an architecture. So we're, we're, uh, we're very grateful that you spotted these things uh, and that you uh, were helping us <coughs> clarify the areas where we have to still to develop in order to bring that out even further. And that's the, the value of these moments, both for our students who are now leaving, uh, but also for us as a program, because many of those in the room are the, the, uh, uh, are the new cohort who are picking up on these ideas and now will take them forward in their own research. So thank you all very much. Uh, it's time to celebrate with a drink. But before I, I close this, uh, I just uh, also want to remind you that tonight we have Anna Kessley from Duplex Architects here at 6.30, uh, who will be presenting our uh, keynote lecture for housing and urbanism this year. And I think all of you have noted the degree to which Duplex Architects have been an inspiration for the program. So we're, we're, we're more than happy to have this, uh, uh, this exclamation mark to the, uh, to the work that's been done. Thank you all very much. And finally, uh, just I would like to thank my team, Anna, Dominic, Francesco, Elena, Steve, who's now gone, George. Um, I think we have, um, We've had a, 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 an interesting challenge this year in having the largest cohort of MARC students um, that we have ever had before. And to reach this point in the year and see the diversity of projects that we've been able to look at today and the range of drawing styles, um, I, I, uh, I think it's, it's quite commendable uh, that as a team, there's been both this diversity and coherence. So thank you all very much, Irene. Uh, your contributions to our architectural thinking has been very important to us. So all to the team, I'd like to thank you all very much. Uh, and we'll see you upstairs at the bar and then hopefully at, um, at Anna Kessley's talk. Thank you all. <laughs>